happy that I'm unavailable. Oh, oh. Uh, <laughs> sorry to take you away for it. Um, yeah, there is a delay on Facebook, so um, don't worry about putting that up and, and, and listening to it because there also might be, you hear it in the background and stuff. So, uh, but like I said, it'll be there for posterity if you want to watch it or link to it or send it to uh, your, your, your fans or followers and such. So, yeah. Uh, Jeff, are we online, Jeff? We are online. Okay. Um, hello, CamCon. Uh, welcome to the uh, 2021 CamCon RPG Creators Panel. Um, I, today's uh, topic is going to be about um, uh, visual design and, and art and how it affects uh, content, uh, tone, and mechanics, and the, the inverse as well, how content, tone, and uh, mechanics can affect uh, the visual design and art of an RPG. Um, uh, I've got a fantastic lineup of guests, uh, and uh, I'll introduce them. Uh, first, we have uh, uh, Stephen Radney McFarland, who's, uh, I, if you've played any D&D uh, from Wizards of the Coast for the past two decades, uh, he's touched it, more than likely. Uh, that's simplifying his credits yeah. uh, greatly, obviously. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a lot of work. He's also uh, working on uh, an RPG called Delve, mm. I believe. Um, uh, we will uh, fix, up, fix up links for that uh, later on, just so people can go check it out. Um, and he's also uh, the designer of the, uh, uh, the the flipbooks and tiles for uh, for is it Pathfinder, Pazio? Uh, uh, Paizo Publishing, yeah, the, the, the Pathfinder and um, the Starfinder flip tiles, so. Yeah, super, excellent. Um, next we have uh, Diego Noguera, is that, is that pronunciation correct? Oh, is that yeah, it's, it's okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, we <laughs> say here, <laughs> yeah, we say, I say Diogo Nogueira, Diogo oh, Nogueira, Diogo. But yeah. Diogo. yeah. Sure, I'll, I'll work on that. Um, Jogo uh, has it's a silent been... game, man. <laughs> well, when I when I go to Gen Con or something, and then I have to give my name to like Starbucks, I just say Bob or John or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to bother with this. <laughs> don't don't overcomplicate things. So yeah. It gets kind of kind of complicated as you start. So, um, okay. Oh shoot, where did my information go here? Um, okay. Uh, Diego um, uh, is, is an artist uh, and writer of uh, Dark Streets and Darker Secrets, uh, Solar Blades and Cosmos, Cosmic Spells, and uh, the recent Emmy winning, any winning, sorry, uh, Halls of the Blood King for Old School Essentials. Um, so we're, we're very pleased to have you here. Uh, and congratulations you. on your, your recent successes with, uh, with Halls of the Blood Thank King. Thank you very much. Yeah, it was uh, uh, a pleasant surprise for me. Yeah. I, I can imagine. Um, next, we have Christopher Swaldson, um, creator of the Black Void uh, RPG, one of my personal favorite books. Uh, it, in, in all honesty, it was probably the book that inspired this particular um, uh, uh, panel. Uh, wow. What I was thinking it was like, uh, yeah, well, I, I, I left my, 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 my betters at CamCon came to me and said, we need a panel this year. And that was like uh, a, probably a day before I contacted you, or the day. Um, so I had to come <laughs> up with something quick. And I'm looking at you and I'm like, oh, this would be an interesting topic. And so I reached out to you right away. And uh, I, I, I just to, to be my own fanboy, gosh, you're, the, the art and the design of Black Void is just absolutely stellar. I love that book to death. So thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you for coming. Well, my pleasure. I mean, I accepted the minute you sent the invitation, so obviously. And to be here with such illustrious people is obviously mm -hmm. an honor for me, being well, a yes, newbie well, in this uh, field. Certainly. Well, you, you most certainly belong here. Um, <laughs> uh, next, we have uh, Shane Harsh. Um, uh, how are you doing, Shane? Um, you're, you're muted, Shane. <laughs> I'm doing well, thank you. <laughs> uh, Shane Harsh is the creator of Neurosia, the Sea of Tears fantasy RPG. Um, and, uh, again, uh, we're completely honored that you've come to join us. Um, and uh, we can't wait to hear what you have to add to the conversation along with everyone else. Um, and, yes. And last but uh, certainly not least, uh, Mark Greenhagen who it might be easier to say what he hasn't done as opposed to what he has done in the RPG space. 
um, but uh, creator of the world of darkness. Um, I am zombie and recently uh, kickstarted uh, Lost Warn. Um, uh, we are totally honored to have you here uh, uh, discussing this with us today. Glad to be here. Okay. Um, I think it's easiest to start off fairly light um, and maybe ask everyone how they got into uh, RPGs as a player, perhaps, uh, or if the, I, 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 I usually assume that most people who make RPGs started out as a player. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, Dia, Diogo, there we go. Um, how did you get into role playing uh, in your youth? Uh... I used to study in a, in a Catholic school here in Brazil. I was possibly eight years old or something. And the teachers let us choose a book to read like uh, outside of the class and, and make a report. And, let, and they, they let the kids choose. So they chose uh, Death Trap Dungeon, the fighting fantasy game book in a oh, Catholic wow. school. <laughs> and they let, us, they let us read that and play that. And so I... I became acquainted with gaming books, like fighting fantasy gaming books. They were pub they they had some translations in Brazil, so I became obsessed with them and started like getting all the 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 many different books I could get my hands on. And by the time I was about nine or ten years old, my family moved to another neighborhood, and in the building there were these these older kids that saw me playing the fighting fantasy game book and, and invited me to. To play an RPG, which was basically uh, a game book that you could do anything you want. You could create your own character and everything. And that fasc fascinated me. And we played Tagma, which is the, the first uh, ever RPG published in Brazil. It's a Brazilian role playing game. It, 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 it exists until today. It's like the third edition of the game here. And it was fantastic. My character like died in the middle of the game. And we, we went to the to the building yard to bury my character sheets in the yard. So we dig it there and put my character sheets and we, awesome. we buried my character sheet and, and I was hooked from, from there and, awesome. and, and couldn't stop playing. <laughs> it never ceases to amaze me the, uh, the, the, uh, the popularity of role-playing games in Brazil in particular. It seems to be a, a very strong uh, role-playing community down there. Yeah, well, um, it's kind of strong, but it's 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 rather small. Right? I mean, yeah. It's, yeah, board games is getting big here, but RPGs is it's still yeah smallish. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Shane, how about you? Uh, how did you get into role playing games? Yeah, I suppose uh, you know you you kind of have the first generation of of adult gamers that were exposed to say you know the first edition of Dungeons and Dragons. And I would say that I'm the first generation of children, right? I, I encountered it um, in 1980 when I was 10 years old. Uh, and, you know, it was my, my friend's brother ran a game. It was amazing. Of course, we died in the first dungeon. Um, and immediately out of the gate, you know, I tried to do something that wasn't covered in the rules, but just thematically made sense. And thus began my journey towards design and frustration with, you know, lack of framework that might exist. So naturally, yeah. I, I, you know, uh, just begged my mom to take me to uh, the hobby shop. We got to the hobby shop. There were no copies of Dungeons and Dragons, but there was a copy of Gamma World. And, you know, of course, you know, nuclear Armageddon, like, you know, all, all, the, all the rage back in the 80s, right? And so naturally, I snatched that up and started playing it and, you know, encountered Thundar the Barbarian, and immediately said, well, wait a minute, I got no spells in my gamma world. So I figured out how to do a spell point system, like I wrote a spell point system for D&D uh, magic and was then able to, you know, have Ariel, the, you know, the princess yeah. uh, sorceress. And so um, that was, that was awesome. Right. And that was, that was kind of my journey in not only into gaming, but also into, to design and, yeah. you know, I started designing my first game when I was 16, right? Just trying to make things work the way I wanted them to rather yeah. than someone else had decided to. No, totally. I, I totally get that. And I, I get that's why people created their, their own rules over the years. Mm -hmm. um, Christopher, um, how, how, did, uh, how did you get into uh, role-playing games? 
Um, it's probably primary school, walking in the hallways of the school. Some of the kids, like a couple of classes higher than me, were sitting around this table with these little miniatures and throwing dice and so on and so forth. And I thought, mm, that looks interesting. And I don't know why, but for some reason, they actually let me play with them. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> and that's when it was born, you know. So then it was like every recess, we were just gathering and I was sitting there with the cool, bigger kids and so on. Um, and that was just awesome. And then from there, it just went to, you know, we had this after school activity club where they did uh, miniature painting which I joined and obviously everybody was there was a role player as well. And then I got my first group and then we started to get into, you know, uh, AD and D and all that stuff. In primary school, it was Dungeons and Dragons, you know, the basic set, the red one with Elmore, uh, the Elmore yeah. cover uh, that everybody knows, obviously. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and then it just went from there, you know, and then we tried different systems and then explored everything, but pretty much stayed within the fantasy genre mostly i'd say um so yeah yeah that was the standard at the beginning and and to your to your mention of, of the dice I, I remember the feeling of first seeing role-playing dice and being like mm. hypnotized by it's like these jewels these are amazing what the heck are these um, exactly yeah uh steven how about you uh, interestingly, my, my, my story is actually very similar to Shane's, including the years. Um, uh, I, uh, I moved to California in, in 1980 um, from the East Coast, and I got invited to a birthday party of my father, a uh, co-worker of my father. And of course, I was expecting cake and ice cream and watching people uh, open presents. And I got there and it was a group of boys sitting around a table uh, playing this weird game. And they invited me to join. They gave me what they figured was the crappy character. Uh, they were playing <laughs> AD&D, um, which was an archer, which I showed them was not uh, through play. And they're like, oh, uh, and, uh, and we were playing against the giants. Um, I immediately went home and cannibalized all of the board games in the house. Uh, I, all the dice I could grab, um, I, I, I turned my battleship uh, into a GM screen and I immediately tried to replicate what I had experienced at that game table poorly. Um, but, uh, uh, and started running this stuff uh, for neighbors and friends and everything else until uh, we could finally get uh, some actual books, which the first, the, the first book, RPG book I ever got was the Duotone um, Tome of Horrors without the illustrations. It was, uh, I bought it for like 50 cents from a friend at school whose brother was selling his collection and so uh uh so it was it, it was a hard slog for my original players not only did we not have the rules and i was making it up as as we went but they were playing the tomb of horrors uh us not realizing how deadly that adventure actually is <laughs> yeah that's i i think a lot of people have similar experiences uh like that uh mark yourself uh how did you get into role playing um, yeah, I, uh, my first role-playing experience was with two Lutheran ministers, uh, one being my father, another being his intern, who after uh, giving his first sermon at a church, uh, came to Sunday dinner and afterwards said, hey, do you want to play this new game? And my dad and I were both avid war gamers, and so we said, sure, and we played uh, uh, d d supplement. This is in the 70s. And I was instantly addicted uh, and, you know, sort of showing up this poor guy's apartment, knocking at the door, asking <laughs> questions. And finally, he very kindly says, Mark, you just can't show up at my door like this. <laughs> so, um, uh, but anyway, my dad wasn't really that interested, so we didn't really play. So I just was learning from him how the game worked. But finally, I found some kids in the next town over. I grew up in a very, very small town. So I was the only possible person who could be interested in such a weird hobby. Yeah. Uh, I met them and, uh, and every Saturday we'd play. Um, but then after a year, uh, I stopped being invited because I, I guess I'd been too focused on, let's story tell, let's make this real, let's not just kill monsters. And so they kicked me yeah. out of the group. Not the first time, um, I, I might say. Um, <laughs> and uh, I was devastated, right? So I sort of lost all my friends. But, um, you know, those couple of years where I was just alone, 
you know, buying books, playing in my head, I think was really key to me becoming a game designer because, you know, as a teenage kid, I was basically um, creating worlds, creating stories, writing things down. And so that, that was really where um, I think, you know, I, I sort of became myself. Awesome. Yeah. I, I think, I think a lot of us probably had those experiences and like to speak to a couple of others, like having the, the, the other kids let you join them. I think part of that is they were always on the lookout for new players. So it wasn't hard for them. It's like, so what this kid's interested, bring him in, bring him in. So I, I know that I've been on both sides of that. So um, now in, in terms of uh, uh, the topic we have today, the union between um, graphic design and 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 the, the topic and and the, the content of uh, of these role playing games is there is there an early game like even before you really started getting into design it, is there maybe an example of of a game that might have uh, uh, really sort of uh, kind of scratched that itch or or, or or shown you that that there is an evolution that is possible here that that there, there might be a synthesis between how the game looks how it's visually presented and its content. Um, Stephen, I, I think the first time was, uh, uh, you know, because I, I became very obsessed and continues to be obsessed with Dungeons and Dragons. And when the Endless Quest books came out, and they had uh, cover art by Larry Elmore, and that's the first time we kind of see Larry Elmore um, uh, front and center on a D and D product. And then the internal uh, art was done by Timothy Truman. Both of those artists just knocked my socks off and it was so different and so much better than a lot of the art that I was seeing in uh, D&D products at the time. I think, it, you know, it is kind of a showcase of what was to come, at least through TSR in that time period. But, but I remember getting that first uh, uh, Endless Quest book and I was just like, whoa, this is even cooler than I thought it could be. Um, uh, and so, yeah, that was probably the first time that something really just knocked my socks off. Right on. Diogo? Uh, as far, I mean, I, I had the Tagmar and, and we had the Dungeons and Dragons black box, the Challenger box in Brazil. That was the first game I played, but it was all medieval fantasy and didn't really make me like a big impact. I, I think the, the first game that, that I saw that was different and, and the art like informed and how I would see the, the world and and the game, the feeling of the game was, was Vampire the Masquerade. I think in Brazil, they released the second edition or something. They had this really iconic black and white art. And, and like this, this yeah, that, that, that yeah. punk feel like the, like gothic or something. And then, and, and the drawings were really like the blood, the dream, the really, really graphic images for, for like for a kid that was, I was, barely a teenager here, like 12 years old, old or something. And, and I got this book and I, I remembered the book smelled so good. Like the paper was completely different from, <laughs> from the paper of other books and would keep smelling the book. <laughs> That's because it had blood in the ink. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it was oh, the first really book that really made an impact for me for, for the, 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 the image and, and even the, the graphic design of the book, like the, the details on the on the borders like this like a gate like a grated gate on on the on the, on the top of the page and, mm -hmm. and it was really different from what i used to play like D and 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 tagmar and other games like gurps was all just black and white and one image here or there you know awesome well then how let's leap right into mark uh, there for that like uh, what, what uh, historically as uh, before you really got into like vampire the masquerade were there games that that uh, uh that, that tended with productions that tended to uh to, to meld those two elements together really well i mean uh you know i feel terrible saying this but not really right <laughs> like, like no just uh, say it mark like, just like my, it. My, <laughs> what i what i like you know, wasn't really around before, you know, like my, my preference, right? You know, and, um, and, but, you know, I took a lot of art history classes. I was really into art history. Um, and, um, and so I've always struck by sort of the, the beauty and simplicity of certain types of modern art. And, and, and so very graphic 
And, and so, you know, I, I got really into sort of the, how to create an emotional, you know, context, you know, through, through very, uh, you know, comic book type art, you know, and, and how that sort of affects people. So, so I remember that being, uh, you know, my major um, focus is that in just, you know, when Rapper came out, there's a bunch of, you know, um, comic books were becoming, there was that big wave of comics being art, right? And so I was deeply affected by that. And, and I wanted that to bring that into gaming and then have people be emotionally affected by art rather than just having the universal reaction, which you normally get is cool, man, which isn't bad. You know, that's no, not that's, bad. Yeah. That's good. That's good. It's better than blah, right? But yeah, you know, there's other emotions, you know? And so that's what I was trying to do, I guess. Oh, no, totally. And, and I was I was hoping that somebody would go and sit, like, like, I go back and you, you look at, at, at the the first books of like D&D and you look at the, uh, the, the first few editions of Saving Call of Cthulhu, they look like rule books and there's not as much in terms of uh, the visual design. And I don't think that necessarily needs to take away from them because obviously their legacy is is very apparent. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it, it's the avail, avoid sometimes needs to be filled. So. Um, Shane? Yeah, and some of that the art I loved, right? I'm not saying it was all trash. I'm just saying, in general, it wasn't my style. Yeah. Yeah. Shane? As I learned more about the art, I mean, I, I learned how to appreciate, like, Arrow Auto's art from, from basic d and It has, like, a weird fantasy vibe that's completely different from, I mean, more modern, uh, more traditional fantasy art. Like, Arrow yeah, Auto's was, was thing, weird. Right? Yeah, yeah, it's weird. Now, now I love the art from, from the, the basic D and D from the, the, the pink one, you know. Yeah, D and D but... art is its own unique thing, and that is in itself pretty awesome, right? Yeah, like you can oh, spot D and D art from a mile away. Yeah, and that, yeah, that is yeah. intrinsically cool, right? It has its own absolutely unique look, and everyone has bell bottoms. <laughs> <laughs> they're still doing something though i look at the covers of uh of like the dutch and Dr dungeon crawl classic stuff and yeah it's like it's yeah. it's got a very 70s old school feel to it so yeah, yeah, um, yeah. shane how, how about you there what, what yeah kind of i mean i just i you know I, I i want to i definitely want to give mark uh a lot of credit here um especially with the pivot in rpg design in general in the early 90s um you know, at that time, I was I was actually working in a game store. Um, I worked in a game store for for a number of years. You know, during the the release of Shadowrun, the release of Earth Dawn, the release of Vampire, the release of Magic, right? And and seeing the evolution of the market, but also what had been in the market before, like uh, you know, Jogo, like like you said, there's GURPS, right? Not 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 to diminish the system, but yeah, yeah, from, yeah. From, from an art perspective, it's like, yeah, it's GURPS, right? It's a functional <laughs> design. And, to, you know, to a certain extent, you say the same thing about champions and practically everything else, you know, that was designed up until that point, that the art was something you inserted. It wasn't part of that experience. And, you know, I think, I think, uh, you know, very, you know, very much acknowledgement to, to Mark and the team for the design that went into Storyteller, ultimately the design that went into Ars Magica and, and how that was influenced. I think one of the biggest things coming out of that, again, Mark, like you, like you said, the, the whole comics as art like shift that was occurring uh, was a uh, whole, right? Human occupied landfill. And, yeah. and, you know, and, if, and if you haven't seen that, you need to go out and see it. Right. And it's it is a it is absolutely uh, a marriage of game design and art, not necessarily great game design, but game design. Right. It's a functional game. Uh, and there were several supplements that came out. Um, some of the you know just amazing things that it was designed on an Atari ST, which was an Amiga competitor. Uh, but but it still had it had a handwritten look to it. Uh, but the layout was fantastic. The tables, the art, everything was integrated. It really had that feel of like some madman writing in their notebook and then just publishing it. And that, you know, I think a, a really good complement to 
like the especially the level of professionalism that we saw with Vampire the Masquerade and the Marriage of Design, especially in the character sheet and and really trying to evoke, yeah. you know, some of the feel of the game just just in that kinest, kinesthetic artifact, right? And that's uh, why I wanted to publish it because I thought it was such a great compare and contrast, you know. As soon yeah. as I saw the Gen Con, I was like, okay, I, I want your game. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's. I think that was really. I think Warhammer had kind of dabbled with it a little bit, like Warhammer Fantasy RPG. You know, they had a good sense of how to blend some art into their game overall and and character sheet design and things like that. So that was, I think, a good first experience. Like, oh, here's a complete fantasy RPG that is rich, right? It's not just mechanical text art, right? And I think that's kind of the shift in blend. And then pretty much you know, the, you know, the vampire team, just like, all right, from here on out, <laughs> if you really want to be taken seriously, right, your, your whole graphic design needs to be more integrated. It can't just be, you know, rules and art as separate. And yeah, I, yeah. I, I actually think that uh, Games Workshop, uh, especially that uh, early in the 80s games workshop with John Blanche and company really deserve a lot of credit for pushing pushing the envelope I mean um, I I think Vampire also did that and everything else but that in, in a lot of ways after you know branching out from D&D &D and looking at other systems uh, it was a whole bunch of rule books that were like piece of art that might have something to do with what's on the page text 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 right. and it wasn't until I found Games Workshop and Warhammer and then uh, later the Warhammer fantasy role-playing and 40k and even Citadel miniatures and the fact that a lot of those illustrators also painted for the studio those miniatures mm -hmm. that I went went there and say you know art deserves a better place in, in in all of these products it's it's an integral part of this it's not just something that you uh you know ask an illustrator to draw something and hope it turns out all right well and I think it was a foundational element of their success I mean yeah. mechanically there's nothing particularly re remarkable especially about Warhammer Fantasy Battle Right, Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, I think, does some make some interesting choices. But Fantasy Battle, you know, I, I, I was never impressed with mechanically. Mm -hmm. But that marriage of art and, and not just the art on the page, but the art in the figures, like yeah. it was a whole experience, and you got to play with it. Right, yeah. that, was, <laughs> that was the kind of. I mean, I th in, in my opinion, the pinnacle of their design is Blood Bowl. Like I'm a huge, there's a big copy oh, of Blood yeah. Bowl right there, right. <laughs> And, and we can talk about the marriage of mechanical design and graphic design as befits Blood Bowl, because I think that's, that's, a, that's a real important piece. But yeah, I think Games Workshop really did a great spearhead there too. Uh, Christopher, what do you think? Well, I think most of what I was gonna say has already been said, but... <laughs> <laughs> it's still uh, important. Yeah, sure. Um, no, I think... The first thing for me was, again, the D&D, &D, the red box, where you have that solo adventure with the little illustrations in. I think most of them were Elmore. A couple of were, were Eastley. Um, but I think that really sort of captured and made you envision what was going on and so on and so forth. But I completely agree. It wasn't until, until Vampire the Masquerade came out that you had this sort of comprehensive marriage between the entire layout and the content of the book. I mean, that was, it was intrinsic in the sense that as soon as you saw, you know, just the first couple of pages, you were inside that world for sure. And, and that's, that's what it's supposed to be like. I think if, if you want to take it outside of uh, role-playing games a little bit, I think one of the things that first inspired me as well would like uh, young adult reader history books, you know, like with uh, medieval ages and civil war things and so on, because you have these huge um, with the maps and the and the great art of the battles and so on and so forth. And they've really made it immersive, same as what you see in a lot of role playing games now. And I think that's sort of the the sense that that I was looking for, and that definitely came with uh, with Vampire the Masquerade. Um, so yeah. yeah. And and I, was, I love those history pictorial books uh, mm. for kids, right? That should have showed the whole, you know, exactly infographics. And and my dad was really into collecting like great infographics from mm. newspapers and stuff. And there were some 
amazing stuff this one newspaper in new york did like in the 1800s that are like the best pictographs i've ever seen and uh unfortunately lost in the flood but but this stuff was unbelievable and uh, yeah i think i think present presentation of uh, be- information in beautiful form is is uh is awesome and i think role-playing games have actually gotten fairly good at that yeah definitely no to, to that and I, I i was brought up um, in a family that valued uh, learning and education uh, immensely. And so we were surrounded by National Geographic magazines and, and books all the time. Uh, and uh, National Geographic magazine does that as well. It's, it, it's evolution of visual design and how it presented its information is absolutely stunning. If you pick up any of those these days, you can look at it and just the way they lay it out is, is fantastic. So I think it's uh, definitely applicable to this as well. Yeah. Um, Christopher, um, yeah. then maybe a more more contemporary. Like, uh, are the, what what are the, like maybe the great examples that exist today that have come up more recently with this evolution uh, of, of of a marriage, as as you said, between the, the, the two uh, notions. There are a couple of new ones that I think are really, really good. One is uh, Scavenger, which is a fifth edition uh, accessory. Uh, or it's, it's not part of fifth edition, but it's made for fifth edition. Okay. And they do some really, really amazing stuff. I mean, it's, it's, an, it's uh, the writer and the artist, is, they're like two guys, and they just manage to merge, you know, the creativity in... And the graphic design is just amazing. Uh, then you have, it came out a couple of years ago, I think, Dragons Conquer America, if anybody knows that one. It's really, really cool. It's about uh, Latin American dragons uh, and the conquistadors oh, cool. and so on and so forth. And it's, it's amazing. I was, I was caught by the artwork as soon as I saw it on Kickstarter. Uh, and then I obviously pledged to it and so on and so forth. And it's just there. I mean the the colors and everything it's just wonderful and then you have fragged empire uh from wade dyer from down under he's done a really really cool job as well uh he's done several different settings now um but the first one fragged empire uh, sci-fi which is really really cool and what he manages to do is that again everything merges together so you know the small infographs and everything is just it's it's so holistically well done that everything just makes sense you know it's it's yeah. uh it's pretty, he's a graphic designer so obviously he's he's got yeah. some he, he knows how to do that um and then i think the last contemporary one i'd mention is nibiru um which was kickstarted i think a couple of years ago as well um they're on uh, modifius as well same as me mm-hmm. um oh, yes yeah and it's it's about this what's it about it's about this huge uh sort of planet kind of thing where people are lost and have lost their memories and so on and so forth and it's just so well done i mean every page when you when you flip to it it's just like a new adventure opens up to you it's really really cool and the maps are amazing as well so yeah. um, there's there's a lot but those are oh, yeah. like my top four Excellent. Uh, Diogo, it looks like you're, you're preparing a bunch of stuff there. What do you got for us? Yeah. Well, you, you talk about the, the, the old school D&D art that's really uh, made me appreciate the weird fantasy art from, from the early D&D. And we're talking about Dungeon Crawl Classic. Yeah. Oh, oh Diogo, 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 Oh, and sorry, you just and the book is completely filled with uh, the book closer? is completely filled with art, even the, the yeah, beautiful, you know, yeah, in the credits oh. page, yeah, and you have uh, like the the table of contents, it's like an illustration with you know, all kinds, all sorts of stuff, and and, and very, very different artists, and some images like the text is in, on the image talking about the guilds in the city. And mm-hmm. all kinds of stuff. It's fantastic. Yeah. It's it's a great, great, great book. Yeah. I'm 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 a DCC fanatic. I have like yeah. all the different covers from different like printings of the game. And yeah. and, and the images inspires adventures by themselves, you know. Yeah. Just great full pages, illustrations yeah. that 
that you, you can go from there. And they have other books like the, the Dungeon Alphabet, which you can like generate uh, all sorts of strange things like A is for authors and you can mm -hmm. generate weird authors. And it's all fully illustrated. Like every book has like tons of art and yeah. sort of really big influence for me. Yeah, well, DCT is a really good example for that idea of, of the marriage yeah. between style and its art, because I think that, that the art very much informs the style of gameplay that, they're, that they were going yeah. for when they created the DCC rules. Mm -hmm. yeah. oh, hold on. Hey, buddy, give me a kiss. Okay. <laughs> Give me a kiss. Yeah, okay. Go for your nap. <laughs> there is this beauty yep. too. Back to the pyramids, by the Neverland, which is like a, a hex crawl setting for D and D fifth edition or anything I else. I've seen that. It's, it's gorgeous. Yeah, it's gorgeous. Like the oh, man and and the monsters, all sorts of. Great, like graphic illustrations, you know, the hex maps, and, and you go, it's really well designed because you go to each hex, and each hex has its own pages to the tables, Perfect, what's, yeah. what's going on there. And it's really it's easy to use, easy to reference, and just looks stunning. Uh, there's another one that's it's recent, it's kind of controversial because some people say it's kind of difficult to read, which is mock more. It's uh, one of the most beautiful books I've ever seen. It's, it's filled with content. Even the, like the, the end papers have stuff you can use, like tables. And the book uses more than 100 different fonts. And it's like one of the rules of graphic design. You can't use many different fonts, <laughs> but it's really, it, it challenges the, your, your concepts of, of game design and, 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 and graphic design. It's just really a, a beautiful book it's really well produced yeah, I gotta get uh, that one. <laughs> yeah. there is mothership which is like a, a space uh, horror game and it's it's more about uh, the graphic design instead of the, the illustrations it's really well informed like the character sheets has everything you need to to create a character right in the sheet and don't have to look at the books this informs you how to how to create your character and and the book itself like all the information regarding like ships in its one spread you don't have like to flip from page to another to find information it's really well designed like that yeah uh <laughs> there's so many things to me like oh, the, obviously yeah <laughs> the knock um like compilation uh, like a big zine compilation from the various blogs of the osr it's really colorful and like this weird images. And I want to show like the dungeon here. They have an uh, adventure in the back. It's really well informed. So you can see the description of the, the number of the room here is on the color. So it's really easy to reference, you know, which sheet description is. So you can navigate the adventure fairly easily. Yeah. And it's, it's a beautiful book. Uh, yeah. I what think it's your stack there, my friend. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think if, you want, if you want me to stop, I can stop, you know. Oh, I just, to, I just want to make sure you don't talk about every single game that everybody else wants to talk about, just in case. Okay. Well, I think okay. one of the things, Jogo, that you, you, put, you brought up that I think is really important um, and has definitely been, you know, a general shift um, is I think more designers are very aware of what is that page turn experience. Like, what what do I see when I'm on this page? And if there's a particular yeah. section, what can I do from a content design perspective to make sure that all of the relevant data for that particular section is at yes. most on that two page spread? And I, you know that's that's not how games have always been designed. And I think you know certainly you know, the current game that I I'm working on right now is a game called Nova Six. It's on our website, Legend Smiths. Um, and that's, I'm making it digest sized and I'm very, very conscious of any table or even rule explanation to say, all right, if I can't flow this properly, 
then I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna insert art here and I'm gonna go to a new page spread or whatever to make yeah. sure that that experience that it's like everything I need is right there. And that, that was that was a critical design element and you and you highlighted that some of that in some of the examples. Yeah. yeah. Many many creators. Yeah, sorry, Mark. Go ahead. Uh, this is a good way to describe the transition we're going through is that it used to be a focus on text only, right? Mm -hmm. And then the designer would throw in the art. Then it was a focus on page, how a page yeah. was designed. And now we're in the air zone where everyone thinks about how does the spread look? So when you open the book with the two pages, you know, designers are always trying to think, oh, how are my spreads going to look? And, and, and for some of us, you know, it's down to at least for part of our books, you know, exactly how each spread looks, which is yeah. an insane amount of work. Mm -hmm. But when yeah. you do that, then you have something that looks absolutely phenomenal because you're integrating your work with the layout artists and the artists to create a unique spread, a unique experience every time you open the book. So every time you open the book, yeah. there's there's a, a brand new experience. Um, it's almost like a, you know, uh, a screenshot of a movie, right? Each one is like, boom. And, and, and that's sort of, I think, a very interesting place where we're at right now. Well, in text editing as well, like in some of those, in some of those layouts, you're like, this paragraph is one sentence too long. Right? Uh, yes. <laughs> <Lord of Fortress. laughs> exactly. I have yeah, edited yeah. my writing text. to make it fit the page. Yeah. <clears throat> many people. Insane. Many well, I like, I I to do. our writing to fit the page, but yet yeah. it's important. Yeah. Was, Many um, authors are, are writing the games on, on the on the layout uh, apps now. Like they they don't write on, on on Word or Google Docs and then go layout. Many people are just writing while they're doing layout. Mm -hmm. That's actually yeah. uh, something that was I found very frustrating when I worked at Paizo uh, for the nine years that I worked on uh, Pathfinder and, and and Starfinder. Is they have um, uh, Paizo style is very strict on no white space at all right and so uh, uh you know, yeah it's it, it's a very art is based sort of, on it, white a, space. right it, it, it's very sort of old school uh magazine oh, style where i would have to add a sentence in in, in a place that was already designed <laughs> or what was worse it's like stephen could you make this feat or this uh class description a sentence shorter and i'm like what <laughs> like can we can we shift the art like that's that's load-bearing text there right that's somebody telling you how to play the game um and uh and you know it 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 didn't happen all the time of course but when it did it was just like yeah could you just add a sentence to fluff out this thing that's already wow. kind of fluffy and it, it that is so it drives me nuts <laughs> Shane, do you like get, going back to the the initial notion? Are there any games that you figure that are like kind of the, the ultimate of, of the marriage between design and, and, and content? Yeah, I mean, we've definitely seen you know some evolution in that. I think you know the the Genesis engine that Fantasy Flight came up with with all the specialized dice. I think that I think that's iconic. But I mean, building on that theme and going back to you know, when a lot of that originally happened, uh, you know, Blood Bowl, right? You had you had specialized dice that were critical for the game, but it had a very um, a very nuanced mechanic to it, right? There's absolute success, there's absolute failure, but then there's conditional failure, there's conditional set success, and then there's in the in the middle, and then your skills played into that to decide, you know, how could I convert you know, any of those states into other states. And the, the restriction that that introduced actually allowed you to think, I think, more carefully uh, to kind of, uh, you know, Stephen's point about feats and talents and abilities and skills and what they would actually mean for the game and to make it, especially in a game like Blood Bowl, which is timed. Right. You don't you don't want to introduce things that are going to slow the game down uh, because of that time element. And yet you want to create a very nuanced level of of play and talent interaction. And I I was blown away by that you know, when I first encountered Blood Bowl in, in the 80s and then wanting to see that actually in 
a fantasy RPG, right? And, and the, you know, the interplay that they came up with, because it, I mean, it's, it's so easily expandable, right? To, yeah. to, to non pitch situations where you're, you know, trying to move a ball. And I think that's, I think we've seen a lot more from Modivius and Free League and things like that in what do, what what does it mean? What do the dice mean? And what do the choices around rules as they interplay as opposed to just a straight roll high, roll low, did you do well, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and that's, you know, that's even the approach that I, I took with, with Nova 6 and wanting to have the dice tell me the outcome, right? I didn't want to have to look up on a chart. I wanted the dice to be definitive and not just a high, low type scenario. I wanted to do it with regular dice. Like I didn't want to have to manufacture special dice because it's awesome, right? <laughs> yeah. It's very expensive and it's, and it's very difficult to deal with. And so a lot of that influenced my design over the years, culminating in what I'm working now on Nova 6. Excellent. Uh, Mark, uh, like given that uh, even many members of our own panel uh, cited uh, Ma Vampire Masquerade uh, as, as, a, as a kind of uh, one of the turning points of, uh, of visual design in role-playing games, um, both how does, that, how, how does that affect you moving forward as a game designer and, and what what do now do you look at to aspire to in terms of, uh, of moving forward in terms of, uh, of game design? Sorry, that's a bit heavy, but. Uh... <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, uh, first of all, I always try to look outside of gaming for inspiration because I want to be cutting edge and innovative in every way I can because I just like being that. But as I've aged and matured, I realized that probably with Vampire, I got very lucky in my timing. And so the, 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 the audience and the, the, the fan base is not always into innovation, right? Like we're very much in a nostalgia phase right now. And I think that's one reason why I Am Zombie didn't really have success is that people want the same old thing, right? They don't want, they don't want the new. And so there's a very yeah. delicate balance um, with that. Um, and in terms of art, you know, I mean, I used to tell the the writing uh, and developers at, at uh, the writers and developers at White Wolf, you know, your writing doesn't matter except to the extent that you can inform the artists of what to do because the art sells the game, right? <laughs> and the graphics is everything. And I, and I said that, I, I say that as a writer, right? Mm -hmm. I, I accept that, right? Like, like this is just the yeah. truth. And I'm as not much as people are going to say it, yeah. I'm not saying that as an artist because I'm, I want to be superior to you. I'm saying that as a fellow writer, that we have yeah. to understand that our role is to create this beautiful world and create this context. And then also, you know, we're the long tail. The writing is the long tail, right? People stick with your game because of the writing. But, but that initial bump, that initial, will they buy it or not, that entirely comes from the art. And so our, our books, the books are judged by their covers as much as, yes. as that's a, a horrible thing. It's sometimes yeah. not. <laughs> I mean, the first thing that's why they have a cover. Is, so it makes exactly. sense. <laughs> and kids these days don't want to read, right? That's, yeah. 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 And, and people, people want something new, but not too new. Right. Um, they they want to feel like it's a familiar book, but yet new, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's, it's a very tricky um, thing to intuit out what people want and what they don't want so and for me also it's very hard because I've been away from gaming so long like you know I live in Central Asia you know I, I spent a lot of time in the Middle East you know working on stuff not connected to gaming at all although politics is a game in a way um, but 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 um, and so I I'm just sort of coming back to gaming and like <laughs> I feel like a newbie you know um <laughs> And so, so it's very complicated to figure out where the, the zeitgeist is, you know, and what, what people want, you know, and really, because you have to, as a game designer, have a deep intuition of what people want, or at least what your fan base wants. So you can give yeah. them something that will, will sell. And, and, and the art is kind of like how you communicate that. And the, and the yeah. graphics and the layout, you're communicating a certain sensibility. And, and if you get that wrong, 
people are going to pick up a book and go, oh, this is not for me. And they're not even going to, they're not going to read a single word really, except for maybe yeah. on the cover, back cover. Yeah. They're just going to flip through mm -hmm. it, looking at pictures, and then they're going to either put it down or they're going to carry it to the game counter based on that. And yeah. so, yeah. so that's why I say that the art is everything because the only words they're going to read is the front and back cover. And other than that, they're looking at art. Well, and, yeah. and I mean, it's got to pass the character sheet test too, if we're talking art. Yeah. Piece, right? um, I was just going to say that, Shane. The, yeah, what, is the I always look that what is the one thing players are looking at the whole game, right? right? What's the one thing they're staring at? The character sheet is like everything. If you mm. can't do the character sheet right, <clears throat> screwed up everything. And that's why I did the dots, by the way, with Vampire in the World of Darkness. No, it's brilliant. Is that, is that too many game designers think everyone knows math. And the truth is most people are <laughs> terrified. Of They're terrified of math and they don't understand it. And, and it scares them. And so I tried to design a game, a character sheet, that had as little math, like numbers, <laughs> on it as possible. And, and I think... Most character sheets fail because there's too much math on it. And that's true. Rolling. I think that's, I, I, you know, that's always my test. Like when I look at a new game, I get drawn to it. I look at the art. I go to the character sheet and I go, can I understand this game from the character sheet? Right. Uh -huh. and, if, and if I, if it's just a bunch of abstract boxes, I'm yeah. like, yeah, no, sorry. Yeah. Right. There are a lot of games that I, I got interested because of the art or the concept. And then look at the character sheet. There's so many stuff, like so many boxes and, and errors. And they, they are, maybe they're informative, but there's so much stuff that's, oh, that's going to be too much trouble to learn this. I'm just going to leave it there. Well, and, yeah. and I think there's there's actually a problem with this. And we, and we talk about, uh, Mark talked about the, the person who goes up into the thing and makes sure that the art uh, speaks to them and if, whether or not they're going to go to the counter and buy the thing. Um, it, but that, it doesn't stop there. There's yeah. large portions of our industry that are basically fire and collect dust games, right? Uh -huh. Which you buy it because you're like, this looks awesome. And yeah, I might play it. And it just sits on your shelf, right? Um, and this is where I think the words and, and the design and everything are important as well. Because if that game's not a compelling experience for X number of people being the average game group, right? Uh, I'd much rather create a game that that people are actually excited and want to play rather than a game that I'm like, oh, there's some interesting layout here and it's just going to sit on your shelf and you're never going to crack it other than to sit there and say, well, it's a beautiful book. Right. Yeah, no, definitely. I think I think you need you need to bridge concept and and, and visuals with playability uh, at the same time. I mean, this this was leading me into one of my next ideas was especially with uh, with you, Stephen, and the uh, uh, the flip mats mm -hmm. and and the tiles um whereas uh, having art in a book is oh here's there's a monster stat block here's a picture of a monster there we go whereas what you're creating with with the the tiles and stuff is very much uh, in, in some uh in in, in in some ways of looking at it um kind of a, a visual manifestation of rules being mm -hmm. put down which is a which is a very different animal, um, or even play space, right? Um, yeah, yeah exactly. I mean, but uh, you know, my partner in crime in this is Jason Engel, who's a fantastic artist, and he takes my my sketches that are uh, very sort of bold and put this here and put that there, and makes uh, makes them extremely gorgeous. But the mm -hmm. the big thing with there's a lot of counting of squares. It's a lot of my mm -hmm. knowledge of where the rules and uh, of, of both Pathfinder D and D and Starfinder and anything else, um, uh, where I can bend them uh, and where I can't break them, um, sort of thing. Uh, and, and it's a lot of fun. And I. Uh, I've also done paint masters uh, for D&D uh, &D miniatures and Star Wars miniatures and even uh, some Pathfinder battle stuff. So there's nothing more thrilling than me scrolling through my Facebook and, and me seeing a table that's using uh, flip tiles and, and maybe a miniature that I, I, I did the paint master for as well. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's, that's hey, a way that most game designers don't get to sort of uh, uh, take a look at that. But um, yeah, yeah uh, the, the, the props and the tools and everything else that you can use with the game um, and, 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 you know, the abundance of those, uh, that has been important since, uh, 1974 when, you know, those, the, that box with three pamphlets came out. 
mm -hmm. um, and continues to be so because it helps to shape um, my primary concern, which is people who live yeah. in these games and this is their best form of fun and escape. And uh, if, if, if they had their druthers, uh -huh. right, they'd be sitting around a game table enjoying mm -hmm. uh, the shared stories uh, that they're creating. Um, I really love making games that people live in. Yeah, obviously. Well, one thing to add to that is that a lot of uh, people think that role-playing games are books, right? That's an mm. assumption a lot of gamers and players and even game designers have. But real, And that is the product. That is what we're selling. But, but right. what we're really creating is an experience. Yeah. And the experience is actually playing the game. Yeah. And so if people buy your book and don't play it, that is almost worse than they're not, for me at least, I, I, would, I would almost rather them not even buy it. I, I would at least play it once. You know, that, well, it's that, not that being is, used since it's meant to be used. You know, and so what you desperately need and want, especially if you want a, a company or a growing a game line, is you have to have people play it. And, and role-playing is very strange. It's almost like a, an amusement, you're almost like an amusement park person you're, you're 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 creating these rides for people to experience and what you're selling is not the ride it's the experience yeah yeah uh, exactly. it's 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 key to get out it's outside of that 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 idea that's uh, i've had to do that with my players and that you know it's like they're reading the rules it's like okay we need to we need to do this and this and this and this and i'm like step back for a second what do you want to do what did you want your character to be let's not worry about the rules let's not worry about you know the crunch and stuff just just be it and experience it and the rest will follow that's sort of my own personal philosophy on it um so well good um, rules will help you do that <laughs> oh definitely definitely uh, the rules are there for a reason I, right uh, but but rule zero is always if the rules don't work yep do something else uh, I, I think almost every role-playing book you read, that's going to be one of the first things they say. So Always say yes, to have fun. step to the rules. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, then th then leading from that, then, um, we'll start with, uh, with Christopher. Um, maybe in terms of your own work, has there ever been a time when you've created um, rules that have uh, directly affected uh, maybe the, the visual um, design element of your game or vice versa, maybe created some, some visuals that you thought were really cool that you needed somehow to incorporate in the rules or the crunch of the game. Um, I think both, actually. Um, I mean, certain chapters have a layout because they pertain to a specific element in the, in the game, obviously. Um, it's about the black void uh, as it should be obvious from the name so you can see friends you see the void encroaching on the pages as you see in these for instance nice um which you don't have on let's say the rest of the book where it's more sort of straightforward obviously this is about blood ritual so you gotta have oh, some like bleed yeah 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 um so I think what I try to do, and that's why I probably spend way too much time designing each page, um, is that it has to invoke what the page is about. Um, you have to, the minute you flick it open, it has to sort of give you an idea of what you're actually going to read. Um, and that takes forever. But when you flick through it and it looks the way you want it to look, that's completely worth it. So that, that's, that's one aspect. The other aspect is usually what I do with my artists now is when I brief them, I just give like key points. I don't tell them everything I'm envisioning about if it's a character concept, for instance. I just mention like the two, three vital things that the character needs to have. The rest I sort of leave into their capable hands because that way they come up with something that I probably hadn't thought about, which in turn inspires me to add different things. And that makes the universe much more alive. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I think one of the reasons, I, I think I've done that actually from day one, but it's become better and better because I've continued working with the same artists. So now they're obviously, we're more in sync with, you know, my vision and their vision has become part of that as well. So 
it's it's sort of it synergizes quite well now um and whenever new ones come in as well i usually send them you know obviously all the the books and so on and uh, to make sure that they get what the concept is and i've chosen them because i was inspired by what i had seen that they'd already done and thought ah why didn't i have that in my game already you know <laughs> but that's i think that's the nature of, of any of these types of uh, artistic industries yeah. is that there's going to be a level of oh that was really awesome i'm going to crib that idea in a manner exactly. of speaking and and evolve upon it um yep. diego same 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 question diego um uh is, is there, especially with you as, as someone who both does art and is a writer uh, of games and rules, um, are there any instances where you've had to, uh, uh, where you've been affected on either or, like uh, your art is, has affected the rules or the rules has affected your art? Yeah, as, as Rudolph said, I've always tried to, you know, convey the, the subject of what's going on in, in, in the text or in the rules and the art. Like recently, this, the trilogy of, of this very small games that I released in like horror games. And everything here is like public domain art and, and, and photographs. And since it's like a zombie game, there's always like this, this scraps of paper and doing like uh, those labels like you print yourself and, and, and there's notes. And like when, when you're talking about the degradation of your your gear starting to to get worse and then it's going down you're losing losing things nice. you know and when we talk about death and it's like in the cemetery or something how you die how you you could like suffer uh grievous wounds and in the zombies like sketches of the survivals made of the, the zombies different zombies they they saw or something like that and, and <clears throat> like the character sheet is also like a piece of paper you 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 got somewhere and and, and you can fill it out and even the the like the, the many possible like story hooks you can use it's like this piece of paper like in a typewriter kind of thing and i made like a game inspired by the old gnd cartoon like you play as kids that get stuck in like a fantasy world and just tries to get out and it's all made to look like a, a picture book because I use it to, to be a children's book illustrator and writer. So like a square book, it's very colorful and then and like really big images and, and just not so many words per page, but it is always like a lot of art, like, like oniric art and these fantasy words. And many of the, the entries I did for the locations in the, in the setting were based on the image that I, I, I had and I look at the image and then I created the, 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 the content and the setting and the, the tables to generate uh, possibilities. And the, the award-winning adventure, like the, the House of the Blood King, I mean, I, don't, I think the adventure was made so much better because of the art by, by Justine, which is this great artist that illustrated the adventure and, and made this, this really wonderful, weird, uh, art like the the boards like this gothic gothic uh, armor and like the shadow hounds with something dying and, and decrepit and, and weird and alien and let me just show the, the the like the spider queen that shows up in the adventure. This I love this piece so much and the her art really informed how how I started to see it because I thought of something after her art. I started seeing something different on my own adventure and, and started changing it because of the, the collaboration between the arts and, uh, and my writing. So I yeah. think those are a few of the examples. I had other things like in, in my game, I have like a heavy metal sci-fi fantasy inspired by Metal Huron comics, but there is like a section about humor. So the adventure on the, the, the art and layout of that section is more whimsical, you know, to say you can play this with humor too. You don't have to be all serious and like the yeah, exactly. You know, totally. so. um, Shane, same questions. 
I, I actually I got I got lost in Jogo's explanation. Oh. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm, I'm such I'm looking for, yeah, I'm, 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 that's great. I'm glad people are getting invested here. Um, the, the idea I'm trying to, to yeah, no, 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 is, yeah, is no, like I, I got personal. It oh. Yeah. So so one of the design elements for Nerosia was that you're actually playing two two levels of the game. You're playing the characters in the game and you're playing the gods of the world. And so um, how, how was I to design that into the game, both graphically as well as mechanically? And I wanted, I, there needed to be a kin kinesthetic element, but it couldn't be something that would take over the game, right? So the idea of like the divine intrusion that, that any player could introduce at any time Right, we ended up tying that together with with a card, right? So we created a system of cards. Um, originally, I think we were like 192 cards. Um, in subsequent revisions, I've gotten it down to I think 92 cards or 90 cards approximately. Um, and the idea is that every player has cards that represent the current influences that uh, or the the current gods that are interested in watching them. Right. And so kind of think of, a, you know, regular, you know, classic Greek mythology where the gods want to be entertained by what the humans are doing. And if they're not doing any, anything interesting, they're going to go on. Right. So the, so there is a kind of a fleeting mechanic that if you get a good card, you want to use it right in order to create an interesting story, you know, create an interesting effect. Uh, but at the same time, it's got to be appropriate. Right. So there's some guardrails on it that you can't just it's not just a wish. Right. It's got to be something that's appropriate in that interplay um, between the design on the card, which is meant to be evocative of of not only the God, but the particular aspect of the God that is in play here, whether it's fertility or healing or commerce or or, or, or you know, anything like that. Right. How you represent that visually so that you've got that at a glance value of it, especially as you mature in your play to go, OK, now I know these gods, but then the interplay amongst all of the players, right? There was one evening where we actually spent two hours and it was just role playing as the gods amongst the players because of something one of the players had done. Now it's all anchored in what the actual classic fantasy characters are doing, but it became this, you know, debate and argument amongst the gods because of the cards that everyone had to play. So it's got to, you know, that des those design elements had to be accessible and iconic, right? They, they needed to have impact so that they mm. come into play quickly. And that was something that evolved over years of playtesting. Like how do we get the gods involved? You know, and, and, and ultimately that's, that's how we, how we decided. And that's, you know, and that's carried through actually the, the uh, Nerosia second edition is going to be dungeon crawl classics, right? We're, we're part of, oh, nice. as Mark said, as Mark said, that kind of nostalgia callback, Right. Nerosia was a deconstruction anyway. So now we're going to kind of bring that deconstruction full circle right back to kind of a classic core fantasy game, which is Dungeon Crawl Classics. Yeah, I was hoping somebody was going to come around to that. I was going to say it myself, but that's uh, <laughs> exactly the, the whole the, the nostalgia element is like exactly what DCC is is embracing in, in terms of that. Well, and, um, and I think that's, you know, to Stephen's point, like what, why do people come back and play a game over and over and over again, right? It, you know, I think D&D 5th Edition is a really well-designed game, you know, and I've been a long time not fan of D&D, but I absolutely enjoy playing it. And it's not just the nostalgia element, right? It's that it's mechanically reliable, right? Ooh. The game is mechanically reliable and consistent and doesn't intrude like i don't fight with the rules sometimes i do have to conform to the rules and i'm okay with that but i don't feel myself fighting with the rules like i did with ad and d and yeah. when you get that marriage of nostalgia and function i think that's a huge win right because now i like i feel like i'm playing D D when i was a kid right all of those things i got behind me keep on the borderlands the goodman games rendition yeah. of that we ran through that in fifth edition and it was fantastic. Like just going back to the keep and, you know, just that massive sandbox that it was, it was fantastic. But to have all those fifth edition modern design elements uh, available to us 
was also fantastic. So I think that's, you know, I think that's a, that's a good cir circle that we, we've, uh, we've yeah. completed. As, as you talk about DICE and nostalgia and MDCC, one of the things that really got me hooked in DCC was the weird, weird DICE. Like they have the D16, D24, D30. Nice. So I, I, I felt like getting to know RPG DICE all over again. Mm -hmm. I am the translator of DCC RPG here in Brazil. And one of the slogans we made for DCC is like, DCC RPG, play RPGs for the first time again. Like, right. Because for me, it felt like playing Fantas room playing all over again for the first time. Nice. Yeah, no, that's that, that's very apt. I like that. Uh, Mark, in 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 the production of, of all the games that you've been involved with, have there been any instances where the visual design has drastically altered how the rules or, or the, the, the content and crunch has come out of the game, or vice versa? Has there ever been a time where you've written some rules and said Oh God, we need something that visually represents this somehow. Um, yeah, actually, with the current um, game I'm working on, uh, Lost Lorn. Lost Lorn. Um, because we had such a long lead time, and because I was able to, you know, basically spend years now developing it, and I had artists who were willing to work, you know, for future payment, but basically for free. Um, for a couple of years now, um, we were able to do this a miraculous thing of sort of evolving the game step by step in conjunction with the artists. And so, you know, one of the truisms in, in gaming is that often when you send art concepts to artists, they have no idea what you're talking about. They don't read what you send them and they don't listen to what you say. <laughs> right and, and, and so and so until a game comes out they can kind of page to the book which by the way advice to any up, up and coming game designer always send the book to artists like if you have a book send a book you already have to your artists because they'll look at that right but they're not going to look at your sketches often you know although i know steven you, you have an artist you said who does with your sketches but generally this is not the case but anyway, with, with these artists I'm working with, it's like there is a there is a conversation, and this is just this is incredible luxury that 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 um you know I'm very lucky to have. So so uh, um, that's kind of you know a unique feature is that we've been able to you know work with not just one or two but a you know um, a whole bunch of talented artists to sort of grow the setting, and so um, the whole writing department. You know, and and, the, and everyone is just all been communicating together. We have a whole big team of people, and and, and it's sort of this is a wonderful collaborative experience, which is akin to like what the magic of a role playing game, right? Like as genius as I think I am, you know, I'm a role player. I know that that my genius is nothing compared to the genius that is evoked at a gaming table or a LARP or whatever you want to, any, any place where role players get together and combine their imaginations, that is a thousand times better than what I can do. And so, you know, I feel like finally I get this amazing experience of creating a game that is, that is like the beauty and magic of role playing itself, you know, like a, a truly collaborative experience. And as a very lonely kid, you know, who's kind of a loner in his life, right? Um, living in weird countries, you know, <laughs> traveling, always kind of alone. Um, it's kind of a cool experience. And I, I think it's going to, hopefully, it's going to create a much better game. Now, whether it sells, we have no idea, but hopefully it'll be a better game because that's <laughs> what just, I'm, you know, most concerned about. Got to throw it out there and see what happens. Um, Steven, same, same notion, same idea. Uh, like have there have personally have there been any moments where where this where this has been a thing for you? Uh, yeah, but sometimes in, in in the negative. Uh, over the years, I have probably written thousands of uh art descriptions and art orders uh for for various things, and I've by all accounts I I've become quite good at them. Some of my artists are like you write the best art descriptions, and part of that is being brief, and bolding the stuff that's really important usually if it's if it's any more than three sentences and and 
uh, you're not getting your point across. Um, uh, and there is that sort of thing that, that artists don't read. And there are definitely artists who don't read and don't listen. Um, I try not to work with them because uh, I find it frustrating. Um, but if I and, and but sometimes uh, just through expediency or, or the way that a, a team is structured, I won't be able to see the end product. Uh, one of the things that I've learned with art descriptions is never tell an artist that um, they uh, uh, your the character is wielding a glaive because forty percent of the time you're going to get the thing from Kroll. Um, and so it's all like, no, it's a pole arm. Like, uh, it, 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 just, just make it a pole. Right. Um, I, I remember a Paizo book. It was MPC codex where I, we got the artwork and I saw it in layout. I'm like, we need to switch that art. One, we don't like, we've got a, a thing that's similar, but I don't think we want a, a, a copyright violation. And I don't know if they're going to come after us for that, but it's, we need to switch that art. Mm -hmm. Um, and so there's been a lot of things where the artists come in and it's all like, um, uh, what, one of my, my funniest examples is I wrote uh, Grendel for Pathfinder. And uh, of course I like to do my homework and it'd been many years since I read Grendel. Um, and the, uh, the wonderful cover art had already come in from Wayne Reynolds. Um, and it had Grendel on the cover, uh, wielding a club. And then the art that I got had Grendel wielding a club. And the big thing stated many times in that story is Grendel does not use weapons. <laughs> so we couldn't do anything about, like, it's said many, 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 many times, right? Grendel rips yeah. people apart with her bare hand, does not. Uh, so we were able to Photoshop the club out of the picture um, in, in, in the thing, but, you know, uh, we didn't want to tell Wayne to take the club off of his beautiful painting that we know yeah. he does not digitally and everything else and so uh, we had to let it uh, let it go with that um my big focus when i have full control over uh, how a thing's laid out is you've got to look at it through a bunch of lenses right is it is it pleasing does it open yourself up to the imagination of what you're trying to present and then um you know what it, it, it is it clear and, and crisp and readable um and then lastly because i do like to make games that people live in is it a good reference book for when i need to find that rule um, and so I'm very sort of picky about what, like, if I've got rules about exposure to the elements, I want to have a nice stunning picture of somebody, you know, dealing with exposure to the elements, because when people flip, you know, they're like, that's, that's the page I can find this stuff on. <clears throat> it's especially when it comes to rules that don't happen at the table very often. And so being able to go through and, and find exactly what you need not by looking at an index, but just by flipping is very important to me. Right on. Um, I have a, a question from uh, our viewership here. A um, uh, question from Brian reads as such. Uh, Making a game brings passionate people together and sometimes heads butt. So as a team, how can you handle the, handle the bigger conflicts about rules or other world building decisions, et cetera, to make sure everyone <laughs> is heard but the issues gets resolved as a team. Um, Christopher, we'll go with you first. Well, luckily, I don't have that problem because I'm the only one working on it. Well, but you have artists. So, I mean, like... Yeah. The, the... No, I mean, the thing is, it's, it's about compromising to a certain extent. Um, I think what you have to do is you have to identify quite quickly what are sort of the essentials and what are the vitals everything around that can be tweaked and so on and so forth but i don't think i is think that either just a funny way of saying what hill you're going to die on kind of thing or <laughs> yeah kind of i mean no, but i i think i've been incredibly lucky so far that i sure. haven't really experienced any of those to to any significant extent so to say I mean, I'm, I'm sure we've all had like, well, that's not entirely true. Um, I have worked with, with some artists where whatever they did is like, okay, I'm never going to work with you again because you don't, <laughs> like, like Mark said, you don't listen, you don't read what I do. And I've told you like 20 times, don't go for that color scheme. And they continue to. Um, so, but, but I mean, 
it's difficult, but you gotta you gotta pick your battles to a certain extent. Um, but and sometimes you want it in an image or or something on a page, and it's just not going to be there because whatever you had is not worth it, and you can't afford to get a new one. Um, I mean that occasionally that happens. Um, so um, so yeah, but I mean again, identify identify your vitals and then stick to your guns on those. Everything yeah. else, in the end, hopefully just embellishes the experience. Um, like everybody's saying, what what I mean what what's important here i mean for me at least is i don't think i create experiences for people i create a framework within which they can build their own experiences right nice. and that's what i want the the layout and the arts to really sort of bring across you know i i don't want it to be too detailed i want to leave something for the imagination to to kind of to kind of be spurred by you know yeah. So I think that's that's sort of where it is. Perfect for me. Well, uh, Shane, Shane, same, same thing actually. Because I realize you're probably a fairly small team too. Um, what about you? Yeah, actually, I mean, we've got. I do have a, a, a team of collaborators, right? Legend Smiths, right? We are plural, yeah. right? There are there are more than one of us smithing away. But I mean, what I mean, the the, the question is brought more broadly. How do you facilitate a team? Right. What is, what does that look like? And, and the thing is, is that you cannot design a game by committee. Right. So ultimately you have a lead designer. That lead designer is responsible for maintaining the vision uh, that you originally came up with. Now, that being said, right, you have a choice as a leader on how much you are going to leverage and bring in those outside ideas and what. I've spent a lot of years actually just in general facilitation and in leadership training and things like that. So able to bring all that to bear. And, and the, the biggest point is to a certain extent, what Christopher said, understanding what is core to your vision. Like what do you, what is it that you're actually trying to do with this game? And then when there's a disagreement about how to do that, then to be able to have a constructive discussion around that to say, well, here, this is why I think we need to do it this way because of the vision. And, and then to have counterpoints brought up to you and to not simply, not simply accept your original idea as the way to realize that vision, right? You have to be, it's not about compromise because compromise means that you're like giving up something here and yeah. there. It's, it's actually building consensus with that aligns with your original design vision. If my design vision was, you know, I only want, you know, two roles maximum to resolution and I want, you know, this, that, right? What are those core tenants? And then making sure that you stick to those and being able to say, yeah, you know what? I fully acknowledge that you brought up some interesting points. The rule doesn't work all the way that we need it to let's let's redesign that rule in alignment with that vision and i think that's where you know that's where you can be very very positive where if you can't articulate things in that way where basically you're saying well this is the way i want to do it that's when you're going to lose that team right because now they can't contribute and they don't feel that their voices are heard when there is something legitimate, because they probably can't care about the game as much as you do, right? Possibly more so. And so you you have to be willing to listen to them because they do have the the grand vision and the grand idea of the game, seeing it published, seeing it realized yeah. in mind, and you want it to be the best way possible. And that's, you know, we, we went through many iterations in Nova 6 as a result of that, but I'm always the lead, right? I always know what yeah. that, that vision is, but I have been willing to say, yep, no, you're 100% right. We need to revise this so that it, it actually realizes that vision better. Yeah, um, always got to be that, that person that's, that's where the book stops here. Yeah. yeah, that's a maturity with collaboration that is really often hard for people to get to, uh, especially if your ego gets in the way. And, <laughs> and it's, it takes a lot of, it takes a lot of, time and skill with facilitating a team, uh, especially in managing yourself, right? How much am I going to let my ego intrude? Um, yeah. And that's, 
you know, for me personally, that's, that's a huge thing to wrestle with, but um, yeah. I am better for the people that I work with. And I, and yeah. I openly acknowledge that. And I think that's the important thing in any kind of team situation to acknowledge. Yeah. Uh, Mark, same, same question. There can be only one. Yeah. <laughs> Yet at the same time, I believe deeply in collaboration. Mm -hmm. But I also believe in the supremacy and of the artist, the artist. Mm -hmm. and and so and so it, it's a it's a conundrum. Um, how, how how do you have both collaboration and one person deciding everything? And one one strategy I have is that just like an improv, always say yes. I, I try to whenever people have an idea, and then my immediate reaction is, oh, that doesn't fit. <laughs> That's not you haven't read the work. Instead, what I try to do is I always try to uh, find a way to um, change the idea slightly and make it fit in somewhere. Maybe not where they wanted it, but I always try to say yes and make it work somehow. And I found that's almost always possible. There's always a way to make it uh, happen. Um, Vivian, I'm in a meeting. <laughs> Vivian, go to bed. <laughs> It's it's late here, uh, baby. It's 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 twelve thirty in the morning. Go to bed. I apologize. I have to ignore you, Vivian. Okay. I think it's moments like these that make these panels that much more wonderful. Vivian, go to bed, or I'll call your mother. So so uh, the whole the whole. The whole thing about that 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 balance is 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 it was the most difficult thing to figure out, and uh, oh my gosh! Oh, and there we go. And Mark's <laughs> gonna go figure it out. <laughs> well, Mark's gonna figure it out. We'll go over to Stephen. We'll let Stephen uh, figure. It. Like oh, th as a side I... note, yeah. As a side uh, note, just I know how this happens. Last year I was producing uh, the uh, the the artist panel and uh we were just starting and in the background you could hear my wife um hollering at my son stop playing with your wiener <laughs> and it's it's still in the live the feed on on our website so these things happen it's wonderful it's great so sorry Stephen, go ahead i don't know if you should ask me this it, it might be a little bit disheartening because uh one of the things that i've struggled with in my 21 year career is the fact that uh um, i've had some really atrocious managers uh, like, and for, for good reason, right? They're people, creative people get promoted up to a level of management and they really shouldn't be promoted or at least, you know, they're, they're just not very good managers. And, um, I've also had some really great managers, uh, and, and, uh, and I respect those a lot, but I think it's a lot what, what, what Shane's saying is being able to have a vision while collaborating as a team and being open to possibilities um, that that aren't, aren't aren't quite your own, uh, and that is, uh, uh, I, I think all of um, all industries are kind of suffering from this, you know, with with everybody going uh, going home and figuring out that the manager who brings the cookies isn't quite the manager who's best at leading the key uh, the team, <laughs> um, and. Uh, <coughs> um, uh, but or, yeah, or be, be, have the, the, the Dunder Keating effect, right? Right, right. Where, where the, you know, so it's both, we have a world of uh, terrible managers. We also have a world in which people who are good game masters think they're great designers. Oh yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. Because, because, oh, I'm a great game. I'm a great game master. And that means I'm a great game designer. It's like, no, they're completely <laughs> no. different. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it was it was uh, I, I was running a, a long running campaign uh, um, a, a few years back and um, uh, it, it was a while and it was players who played with me before I started working at Wizards of the Coast and then later Paizo and, uh, you know, good gamer friends. And uh, I, I remember one of them looked at me at one point after a game. He goes, you look at the he goes, I just figured out you don't see these games the same way we see these games he goes for us it's fun for you it's work and i was like yeah. <laughs> luckily for us the work is fun yeah well, work is work, work. work is fun it is and, work first um but you, you, 
you know, when, when you work on these games for that long, even when you sit down and, you know, and everybody's like, Ooh, we get to play a game. You're the back of your mind's always going, what's great about this mechanic? What's wrong with this mechanic? Uh, what's great about this story element? What's wrong with the story element, right? You're always uh, sort of looking yeah. at it through that through that sort of lens. Um, you know, even with board games are kind of ruined for me because I don't care if I win or not. Right. I'm analyzing the game. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm still having a great time. I'm just, I just don't care about winning and that kind of annoys my kids. Yeah. And so, um, uh, so in a lot of ways, right, um, uh, do what do what you can know your strengths know your weaknesses uh, be open and honest um, uh, you know uh, don't be confrontational until you have to uh, my my uh, roadhouse Dalton rules just be nice right um, is until it's time not to be nice which hopefully those times are are few and far between uh, realize that uh, everybody you work with is another person and uh, they have good days and bad days Um uh, come honestly and compassionately to the table whenever possible. Um, those are the best ways to, uh, uh, to be part of a team and then even facilitate a team. Um, it yeah, sounds like simple first. advice, but it's yeah really true. Oh, it's, it's hard in practice, obviously. So. Mm -hmm. um, Diogo, uh, your, 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 your ideas. Yeah. For mo most of my stuff, it's really like a personal project, and and early in the in the beginning, I mo I did most of the art of my own, my own stuff, and but before that, uh, I tried to to publish a game here in Brazil, with like a, a friend of mine, like in a partnership, and it didn't work out so much because we wanted different things, and and after some point, uh, for me, I felt like I was doing most of the work so it kind of stopped it there because it was going to be like for the first project i wanted to make like a 500 pages book and it's from like an independent publisher it was like impossible and then i i switched to more compact stuff but now uh i i just started uh being invited to collaborate with other authors like recently from last year and so and for me it was great because like i'm, I'm from latin america and I always felt like an outsider. And then I started being invited to work with, with people from Europe and the United States, people there that I really admired. And I, I was following, following even before I started writing anything. It was really fantastic for me. And, and, and I, I always take the, those opportunities to learn. And I'm, I'm really not really so attached to, to my stuff. I mean, if I have like a strong concept, I, I try to reinforce that. But they, they give me ideas, and, and even if I, I don't agree so much, I, I try to, to learn as much as I can and try to incorporate that. And, 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 and if it's not to my liking now, I can remake it sometime later and, and interpret, it, interpret it in a different way, you know? So mm -hmm. that's, that's usually how, how I approach it. I, for me, it's just an honor to be working with other creators that I admire, and, and we exchange stuff, and I learn a lot from them. And, and yeah, that's how I see it. Uh, okay, that's awesome. That's awesome. Um, Mark and anybody else may want to uh, chime in on this. We have a specific question about um, uh, from uh, the werewolf rule. I have this awesome uh, and quite graphic sequence of characters transforming to Krinos form and fighting to death over several spreads. Uh, I think it's a very iconic of uh, the werewolf theme. Was it an idea of the artist, or is there a story behind it? Do you, do you know what he's talking about? Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, that was um, um, that was an idea. Obviously, when we started uh, Werewolf, my first thing I said is, "This is going to be our comic book game." And then, because Josh Timbrook was my friend and I love this art, I said, "This is also going to be our anime game." And so, so that was going to be the main area of difference and i knew if we're going to have multiple games in a series that nested together each game had to have its own identity not only in terms of the writing but the graphics and so i wanted the graphics to be completely different and we expressed that by putting holes in the cover which turned out to be a mistake when it's a soft back book but <laughs> en enough of that uh, i was very happy with the idea at the time so anyway um, um in terms of thinking about comic books 
I believe it was it was Josh who came with the idea. Of, you know, let's let's do you know, let's not just think of pages and spreads. Let's do things over many pages and have a continuity. Uh, Rich Thomas, uh, who does Onyx Path Down, uh, also was involved in that, and uh, it was a lot of work, but but I, I think it really um, paid off. It sort of created a unique texture to the game that hadn't been around before. Right on. Um, okay, I've got one more uh, question. Uh, it's for everyone um, from Hamad. Um, when you think back on how you designed your first game and overcoming the challenges and pitfalls involved, what would you, what do you wish you knew back then that you know now? What advice would you give to someone designing their first game? Um, let's start with uh, Shane. I honestly uh, kiss. Yeah. <laughs> it, it really, like the the first game that I mean, the first game that I published was a 500 page monstrosity. Um, I, I'm I'm glad that I did. Uh, I would not have been able to do it without some of the collaboration that I did. Um, and it's almost like in in coming around and and starting Nova Six, it it was that keep it simple. Uh, philosophy i think you know don't don't try to redesign dungeons and dragons try to come up with <laughs> i mean just don't my uh, entire and, career man <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait a minute that's what i'm doing right now that's exactly <laughs> what lost you guys is. are professionals right Holy like, shit. your first game your first game out the door should not be to try and redesign dungeons and dragons it's been done it's been done very well multiple times in different ways and chances are you're unlikely to be adding something novel to that approach now steven and mark right th these guys probably absolutely are bringing something to <laughs> so, so i really hope so but now i'm gonna be up all night questioning myself thanks a lot i will not sleep a week I mean, i'm sure of it the the the, the church like when uh, there's a, a game design conference called metatopia where you get to meet all these great designers is fantastic and the term is fantasy heartbreaker right don't write a fantasy heartbreaker unless you know what you're doing um but keep it simple like make your game I think one of the one of the like Bork board coming out of nowhere, right? I think what makes it great is that it's thematic, it's wonderful, um, and and it's simple, right? And then you can build on that success. Just don't try to tackle five hundred pages out the door. Not to mention that most people don't want a five hundred page game today, right? And so that's that's yet yet one more thing. Just so just keeping it simple. Uh, and, and James, I do. There was a question uh, earlier about. Uh, player facing dice mechanics so i, I want to I, I did see that okay i'll, 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 I'll I'm done with my answer that. to that question keep no, it simple. not a problem yeah um uh christopher um well now after having heard shane like um, my first uh, book was 424 pages obviously i got it wrong but um, as apart say, from that, not as we do right? <laughs> No, I think there's, for me, there's two things. One thing is um, learn when enough is enough um, because you are your worst critic. And I'm, I think I'm probably not that different from everybody else in, in being a perfectionist. You know, you want it to be the epitome of what it can be. And that always takes way too long and, and quite often means that you actually don't end up publishing it, to be quite honest. Um, so, you know, f figure out where the bar is, when is, when is it good enough for, for what you want it to be and, and keep in mind that it is a framework and that you can rework it later and so on and so forth. So that's one thing. I think the other thing is, um, for me at least work with more intrinsically with more people, because as I said before, this is, this is sort of a passion project, same as Jogo said, um, and I think it, you know, working on games, it's always good to have more eyes on it. More eyes and more ears are always better than just your own pair. Um, so to so get more people heavily involved also because then you're more people to, to do the heavy lifting, which is really, there's a lot of heavy lifting. Um, again, it's, it's a passion project. So 
I enjoy doing the heavy lifting, but I think there are a lot of places where, you know, it's beneficial to be, to be more people. And you spot a lot of, you know, silly errors and mistakes and so on and so forth that, that you could avoid it. And you spend way longer than you should have just finding and, and recognizing. So, um, yeah. so yeah, that, those are my two uh, cents. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Mark, anything about, uh, advice for, for burgeoning creators? Actually, I just wrote an article today about this that I published in, uh, Facebook in our lost Lauren group. So, um, um yeah um uh, let me basically uh um, we'll put a link to that in the in the in the comments so people can come take a look at that yeah so. okay yeah <coughs> so, so. join the lost learn group and you can read it but basically um you you want to a lot of time is wasted by game designers going backwards like you, you spend a lot of time working the game system and then you figure out later on oh i don't need this game system right uh, and then you eliminate it. And so my, my general thing, because I'm a minimalist, is that the best rule is no rule. And, and so what you want to do in the very beginning of your game design is figure out, you know, what your concept is and what you're, you absolutely need rules for. And then say, here's the stuff I don't need rules for. I don't, I don't want to do it. I don't need to go there. And then try to give the absolute minimum rules. Because even if you're really big into... Uh, you know, mini maxing or war game style rules or whatever, even those people. And by the way, I'm, I'm a storytelling person, but I like that stuff too. I like all aspects of gaming. I'm a total gaming nerd. I love all kinds of games. I love all styles of gaming. I can sit down with any gaming group and have fun. That's a fact. Okay. But um, all groups, what they want is they want to have the maximum fun of the kind of fun they want to do and as little of everything else as possible. Mm -hmm. So everyone wants to be a minimalist in one way or another, right? Because you don't want to waste time on crap you don't want to do. And a classic example in role-playing game is encumbrance, right? Everyone wants to have encumbrance rules, but they're a real hassle. But if you don't have them, some guys may end up carrying around 50,000 gold pieces or whatever, and it's just stupid. You know, and and my my rule for that is basically, you know, basically just tell the game master, oh, if you find out that someone's carrying a ridiculous amount of stuff, you simply tell them, oh, you lost it. it you know, you bear, either you bury it or you lost it. You know, and so <laughs> basically you put in a really a one sentence or two sentence rule that that lets the players, you know, judge themselves. And if you read their character sheet, they're doing something stupid, then you as a game master have the right to come in and go, nope. <laughs> Either you tell me right now where you buried that or you've lost it. You know, and that's a very simple way to take care of what for most games is a torturous rule system, right? Mm -hmm. you know, it's torturous. We can like, probably have a whole panel on encumbrance rules. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and the answer is there should be panel. no, and the answer is there should be no encumbrance rules. Right? That's mm -hmm. the answer. The best rule is no rule. And so you just put a two, three sentence thing. If the game master reads your character sheet and judges you have too much stuff, then you no longer have that stuff. I will point oh. out that's a rule. It is. <laughs> it is. <laughs> it's a oh, bunch of thrown. <laughs> it's a minimalist rule. And, 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 awesome. and, and if you can't have no rule, then have a one sentence rule. And if you can't have a one sentence rule, have a two sentence rule and so on. Uh, Steven. I think if I was uh, to go back to my younger self uh, and it was something that uh, I, I figured out probably in my uh, first few years of, uh, uh, of working in the gaming industry is um, throw away the notion that you were somehow looking through a magical telescope and writing about a world and realize that you are actually writing about creating a narrative experience. Um, much pain and heartache uh, can be, you know, I, I'm one of these people, uh, not only do I like to do a lot of research, uh, the amount of research I did for like the weapon system in Delve is crazy, but uh, <laughs> it also, those, what I came up with actually simplifies 
um, and, and, and streamlines your trad traditional medieval weapon system, right, to something that you can have a lot of flexibility without a lot of rules um, and, and throwing out, uh, you know, certain uh, sacred cows and whatnot. Um, I also like to ask, why do we have this rule and why do we feel like we need this rule? And I do a lot of what I call rules archaeology, going back into the source and everything else, um, which uh, it, in my own particular case is John Peterson's uh, Playing at the World was it's extremely helpful in, in, you know, at least knowing where to look. Um, so uh, keep it simple. Uh, absolutely write the games you want to write, even if it is like your first game should be the game you really want to write. And it might be monstrous and it might be overly long and everything else, but do that. Um, you're going to learn a lot in that process. Uh, keep it keep it simple. I, I, I agree with that as well. Um, uh, and just keep on doing it. Yeah, I think, I think you know, like you know, my comment about don't try to recreate Dungeons & Dragons. If you are, actually try to recreate it right Start with the 30 <laughs> rule book right that works right and then expand and build don't try to arrive at fifth edition yeah. right and i think i think that's keeping it simple oh I, I would tell myself one more one more thing uh experience points are bullshit yeah yes <laughs> As a GM, I totally throw them out the window every time. I'm like, no, I do. I, I have never used time. experience points in my <laughs> life as a game master. Never once. Yeah. I have designed way too many experience point systems for, and, and then realized later on that this is just garbage. Yeah. yeah. I sort of feel the same way in some respects about alignments because I want people to play how they're going to play as opposed to being oh, instructed yeah. what they're allowed to too. play so yeah um, they're bullshit, but, but 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 it was a beautiful yeah. thing when we were kids to see this chart of morality oh right? yeah and and i i think that was a, a seismic <laughs> event in my life and we can't dismiss that right but at the oh, same time we have to say that perhaps our culture has, has moved to a point where that seems a, a, a tad simplistic I think it's useful as a uh, as a reference as opposed to a set of rules. So yeah. you look at that chart of, of chaotic, neutral, lawful, blah blah blah, and all that, and and as a reference of of, of how people act. Based uh, on to be, to, stuff, it's kind of cool. To be the contrarian, I actually think it's done damage to yeah. uh, uh, people psychologically. I agree. Oh, wow. I, I I agree with that. I think it was a, a I think it's 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 become so entrenched. And some people's mindset that they actually think that's true and you see gamers sometimes just say no that's wrong and you can see that in their mind they think that that they're right that there is a, a good and evil and, and they don't understand that, that it's all perspective you know right and, and that's why when i talk to someone like that i always sort of mention that you know the way i use alignment or the way i see it is that you know in your culture what you do right is lawful but in their culture, what you think is evil is their lawful. And so, so the axis spins around depending on what culture you're from. And so it's completely different from your perspective, what, what is lawful and what is evil, what is chaotic. And so, I, you know, with that one addition, I think it can, it can kind of work maybe. Yeah. Uh, Diogo, any, any, any comments? Yeah. I, I I'm, gonna be the, I'm gonna be the dissenting voice here. I, I I don't think experience points are bullshit. I think they make a huge difference because you see, like old school RPGs, like old school D and D, experience points is for treasure, not for killing monsters. And more modern D and D, it's like you get a lot of experience for killing monsters, and it changes completely changes the way you interact with the game. And, and I, I think experience points can be a, a huge thing to to model how you play the game like for example my cyberpunk uh game that's inspired by the the, that, the cyberpunk movie like money is time like you some people have a, a few days to live and they still buy a coffee you spend like the justin timberlake one right yeah yeah uh, i made the running out of time and and in that game uh the way you like advance your characters like you share your time with other people so it's about a game about sharing your life, sharing your resources. And that's <clears throat> that changes how we play the game. We don't play a game to just uh, accumulate wealth or, or something like that. 
there's a lot of games that that play with experience points to inform what the game is about and and i think that that's really important and about alignment too i don't because the way i see alignment is like gcc changed how i say alignment. alignment for me is not like they're good or bad it's how you're aligned to the cosmic forces so there's cosmic force of order and 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 lawfulness and, and 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 molding everything in a box, and there's chaos, which is like freedom. It's not necessarily is, is bad. It's like freedom, it's change, it's entropy, and neutral is, can be like the balance. So, for me, like characters, everybody is neutral unless they make something to align themselves with cosmic forces of chaos or or order or neutrality for something, <laughs> but. Getting back to the, the, the like advice for people that are starting to want to create stuff. Uh, I mean, start small, uh, as small as you can. So you, you can finish something and feel the, the, the sense of accomplishment of finishing something. There is a lot of games with like free licenses. You can get the system and just making something small. There's a lot of game gems on each, for example, for people that are into indie RPGs, like games you make in like a single page game, like a pamphlet game, business cards RPGs. Uh, and you, you can see what people are doing and make something similar way and exchange with so many creators like uh, El Nietzsche on Twitter, uh, people doing amazing things and start contributing to zines. Like the DCC, com I started contributing to zines, like do-it-yourself zines for the Dungeon Crawl Classics RPG. And I started seeing other people like me, like just, just players starting to making their own stuff and start with a small adventure, a monster, a location, and go build for that. And, and if you try to limit yourself, it's a really good for, for like creativity. I, my first game was Sharp Souls and Sensor Spells. I said, I need to create a game, a complete game, under 64 pages in a digit-sized game. So that was my, my goal, and I just went with that. And don't be too worried about being original, because nobody's original. Everybody's just getting cat, references yeah. for, for everywhere. One of the books that made me create stuff was the, not this one, like the Steal Like an Artist from Al uh, Don't be afraid to, to steal stuff and... and and reinterpret it and make it your own uh, because like there's book. there is yeah. there is a, a saying that says everything that needed to be said has already been said but since nobody were listening you can say it again you know <laughs> so, nice <laughs> yoga okay. you not only, you not only convinced me about experience points but i just wrote a rule for my game based on what you said uh in, in <laughs> badlander we have drama stones which are like in, uh, inspiration in D D only that are collectively held by the, the group at the middle of the table. And what I wrote is that however many drama stones you have left at the end of the game session, that's your collective experience points. And you yeah. get drama stones basically by being creative at the table. Nice. And so the that's game awesome, is a secret amount. Don't you think this works, Jonathan, for, for, for Badlander? <laughs> so anyway, um, so yeah, you don't really convince me, but I wrote a game rule <laughs> at the table. So everyone listening to this, remember, Live inspiration for your game ideas can come from anywhere, anytime. Always be yeah. alert. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah and be ready to change and your mind. I have an article too about the like ten unpretentious tips for people that want to create stuff. And I can send the link to. And it's all about that. It's about trying to keep it simple. Don't worry too much about uh, who you are, what you're doing, because you can always make something else next time. And one of the things I do, it's always. Uh, I finish a game and I see what didn't, didn't I look too much into it and I can take that and explore in some new book or some new game and always build from where, what you left behind. So, and, and these books Next were really important to me by Austin Clean. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, I've got two more questions. Um, one was the one that uh, Shane was asking about that was posted to the Facebook. We'll do that. And then one more. I know it's been going long. You guys have been fantastic so far. So um, this is the question from Andrew on the Facebook page. There seems to have uh, been a huge tick in popularity for games that have systems using face play player-facing dice mechanics. Morkberg, 
Borg, sorry, being quite a big one. Is this the way that tabletop role-playing games should go for rules simplification that can relieve the DMGM from being locked down by their own rolling? Uh, uh, well, I, I, I missed the part about dice on hexes. What? Oh, okay. Uh, I'll, I'll read it again. There seems to be to have been a huge tick in popularity for games that have systems using player-facing dice mechanics. Mort Borg being quite a big one. This is the way that table is this the way that tabletop role-playing games should go for rules simplification that can relieve the DM or GM from being locked down by their own rolling. I, I, and I think by player facing they mean player only roll, right? Yeah. Like, yes. Yeah. As opposed yeah. to rolling behind the screen versus. Uh, 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 so the, the, the game master never rolls dice. The game master never rolls. Yeah, uh, yeah, if yeah, I can yeah, feel yeah. this one first, since Nova Six is player. Please, only. that's that's what I was yeah. hoping. Yeah. Um. So so Nerosia is absolutely not player only roll. Uh, it's you know classic. Everybody rolls. Um. Uh. Very crunchy mechanics. And in making the choice about Nova Six, uh, I was. I'd encountered a lot of, let's say, modern RPGs that had made that choice. And I actually challenged myself to say, can I make that type of game that I would enjoy game mastering, right? So I forced myself to play that way because 30 years of gaming, I had never done that. And the result has actually been very, very positive. So, you know, there's certainly the, there's the kinesthetic fun of the game master being a player in their own game. Right. But then there's also the freedom as a game master for me to be able to just sit back and orchestrate and not have to be involved in dice rolling, doing math on my own. Right. Just really setting dis difficulties in, facil in facilitating that. And I think very much for n more narratively driven games um, that are all about player agency the player only role mechanic is an extremely important aspect of that. And it's a way that simplifies player agency because when you have player agency controls like plot points or fate points or whatever, the use of those points gets complicated if I'm rolling or you're rolling or they're rolling, right? If the person who's spotlighted is the only person that rolls and that's the only role that matters, then the simplification in the rules and feats and talents and clarifications, like all of those things, it actually streamlines the game immensely. So I think there's a lot of forces at play why that is happening. But if you have not played a game like that, I encourage you to do so. And it may not be for you, right? It is a different play style, uh, but I think there's value in it and because it contributes to simplicity, I think that's why you're seeing it a lot um, because most modern games are smaller, simpler, right? To the point. And, and those types of mechanics really simplify that, that clarification. Yeah. Uh, the, the new edition, the newest edition of Paranoia is Diceless for the GM. Um, mm -hmm. And I've run that a, a couple of times and uh, it, it's, it's a pretty fantastic experience, but at the same time, it's, it's funny how it's a mechanic that, kind of leans heavily into the design and, and, and narrative concept and conceit of the game because the computer is all powerful and the right. GM is playing the computer. So you know, of course they don't need to roll dice. It's like, yeah. if you're dead, I decide that a laser yep. beam comes out of the ceiling and blows your head off and we yep. move on. Um, so uh, it definitely runs in terms of that. Uh, anybody else have anything to add to, to that question? Diego, Diego? Yeah, I mean, most of the games that, that, that have this just player facing mechanics, uh, they could work with the, either way. They're, they're just inverting the logic. Instead of you rolling to, instead of the enemy rolling to attack you, you roll to defend them. But if you, if you invert the, the dice, you can, you can work the other way around. Because uh, my games, the Sharp, sharp Swords, Mr. Spell, Sword Blades, and, and Dark Streets, they were inspired by among other things like white hack and black hack and i think black hack is only player rolling mm -hmm. uh but i inverted that because for me uh the old school experience has a little bit of the adversarial gm 
kind of feeling. It's not real because the GM could kill everybody if they want, but it's part of the feeling that it's it's a challenge. You're trying to to get to the end of the dungeon without dying because the difficulty is a part of the old school experience. So I remember tables that it, it was exciting to see like okay, it's the monsters attacking. So the players have that expectancy of how is the GM rolling? And, and, and there's the, those GMs at the legendary always go really high and the, the players hate when the GM is rolling because they always roll waiting or high or something like that. So that was important for the experience of, of the game. But it, the game could work either way, like if the player is rolling or the, the GM rolling. So it really depends on the kind of experience you want <laughs> for the game, at least the way I see it. And I, I'm now designing a game that's it will be player facing, but there will be a box that explaining that if you want the GM to roll, you just invert this this calculation, and the monsters can roll for themselves too. You know? Nice. Yeah, I really yes. think I, I think it's kind of what you want to do with that to 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 agree with the last point. Um, the the idea that somehow it increases player agency, I think nine times out of ten is an illusion. It doesn't like. Uh, rolling dice is, is 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 the opposite of any kind of agency. It's when you sit there and say, "Okay, what happens?" Right? I've I, I've put all the agency in, and now we're going to you know roll the dice, flip the coin, do anything else. Um, uh, and there are aspects of of stories in RPGs that uh, I I typically like to GM. I roll my dice on the table unless it's critical that I don't. Um, I'm a big fan of secret roles in the case of like, I make a knowledge check. Well, you, of course, are going to think whatever pops up in your head is correct because it's your head, right? When you see that I rolled a one and then I give you information, it sort of ruins part of the story, right? Um, I like, you know, when I roll a one behind the dice and give some, them something that is just dead wrong, but, but plausible, Right. And then they go with that and they find out that they're wrong, just like a, a person, uh, you know, kind of does that and sometimes make weird justifications of why they're actually not wrong. Um, uh, and so to 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 say that it, it, it increases player agency, it, it's it, it's a way of doing things. You can absolutely do it um, and you your game can be better for it, uh, but it does sort of shave off some other aspects of play. Yeah, I think yeah. It, you know, the agency component of it, you, you have to design with that in mind. So right. I, I, I will, if, if we're just talking pure mechanics, then it's all math and it doesn't matter, yeah. right? But when we're talking about what is that design philosophy in terms of the player experience relative to that as relates to other agency mechanics, mm -hmm. then it does simplify a lot of the design because you only have a one-sided conversation. Mm -hmm. I don't have to design... Sure player agency yeah. mechanics that have to accommodate both the GM's role and the player's role because that, you know, because the math is inverted there. Um, and, you know, we, we see some of those complexity in fifth edition, um, even with inspiration, which is spent before the role. But when you get involved in agency mechanics that are spent after the role, then it can get really, really complicated. Um, and so that's why going with a player, player only role mechanic does simplify a lot of those agency controls that are out there yeah that's yeah. And, and you know those things are in pathfinder and everything else i find uh more often than not when i design new games i take reroll mechanics out of it mm -hmm. the, the best agency is like oh did i just fumble did i just fail i'm going to spend something to make that a success mm -hmm. which is really what you're kind of hyping in that kind of yep. mechanics with only a percentage chance of it happening so why not just give the player what they want right exactly. or even no, that's, on the, on yeah the end that's how nova six is designed we're not yeah. re-rolling yeah. it's like you get it you, and, you're, and you're gonna spend that you get it. dice rolls from a game is good basically because most people do not realize that when you're rolling dice endlessly, then that means that each dice roll, mathematically speaking, has less and less impact, and you're just going to the mean. So the ideal role-playing game would basically have, per game session, 10 rolls, because then each of those rolls would actually be a plot-affecting moment. If you have any more than 10 rolls, mathematically speaking, you're, you're basically just, it, the rolls are just, you know, magic. It's just, it's just a show. It doesn't matter. 
right? Because because if you have a hundred or two hundred rolls per game session, which most games do, then the, the average out of those is such that it, they just don't matter, and, and really you're just faking it. So so so, and then. And, and so that's why my new game, Badlander, has the one rule rules the one rule rules them all uh, rule, which is you, everyone rolls one roll roll per turn, and that affects everything you do in your turn. You have one roll, and and we try to limit the rules in a variety of ways so that the rules actually have a weight and a significance. So if you can take out the game master rule, which I ended up not doing um, because people love it, right? But I wish I could because then the, when the player makes their roll and they fail, they get damage. So there's a mo- all that much more da- drama. When you succeed, you do damage to them. When you fail, you take damage. It's very, very dramatic. And so there's a, there's a power to that, right? But, but, um, but it, it, it's complicated, you know? Uh, people want their, they want their dice rolls, you know? Even if it act- lowers the drama. And so I think the way you get around that is, of course, you have to have, you know, basically the roles that are just there for show. And then you have certain roles that are there wherever the table is leaning over, they're waiting, <laughs> they're dreading it. And then, then, then they make the role and everyone at the table, goes, ah! right? And, and that's, that's how you create drama. But, but, but you don't have drama normally with dice rolls. It, it, it's an illusion. Yeah, th- there's a game uh, from Chris McDonald, the Into the Odd and Electric Bastion, and, and you talk about agents and rolling dice. It makes very clear, like your agents, it's you. You try to avoid the dice roll as much as you want. So you describe your action, say what you're doing with the most clarity to avoid needing to roll anything. Because if you're rolling dice, you're putting yourself on the line to to happen uh, crappy stuff because. The game almost doesn't have uh, tests. They don't have saves. So you save to avoid terrible things happening to you. So you're doing something that there is a risk, then you roll. Otherwise, you don't roll for anything else. Even combat, you don't hold, you don't roll to hit or, or to avoid damage. You just roll your damage. You attack, you do damage. They attack you, they do damage to you. That's you, So you avoid combat as much as you can because, you know, if you get to combat, you're, you're taking damage. If anyone attacks you, it's like automatic. So... It's really reduced the number of rows, like Mark was saying. Like you, you just roll for the most dramatic uh, situations it, as it's, possible. It, yeah. It's really people really don't understand it. And like, like Sid Meier, you know, he he described a game as being a series of difficult decisions, right? And that's the essence of a game. But yeah. I think in role playing, we've kind of lost our way a little bit, and we think it's a series of roles, <laughs> and, and and that really is yeah. wrong. Like on a psychological basis and a mathematical basis, you know, because you, 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 well, the more rolls you make, you're going to the words the mean, and the mean is boring, right? It's just, it's yeah. just average, and 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 so I, I do believe the next big wave of role playing games will probably still have dice because dice are cool, and there's a mystical aspect to dice, right? They're not going away, um, but but we're going to use dice in a different way. That, that actually, yeah, that actually sort of leads me into my final question. Um, it's in terms of the future of, of role-playing games, um, though, just to pull it back a little bit, just in terms of, of visual design, um, just thinking where, where are we headed and, and where do we have yet to go uh, in terms of, of tabletop role-playing game design? Um, uh, start, with, start with Mark, actually. Uh, where's it going? Mm-hmm. Uh, um, well, first of all, if anyone out there uh, is an app designer and uh, wants to work with me, uh, I have some huge ideas on how to make role playing work better uh, using your phone and apps. And uh, you know, I think that's the future. And I, you know, I have multiple papers written about it. Uh, and I'm dying to do it. I think the future is going to be that, especially for LARP and, um, you know, um, you know, in world, you know, role playing augmented reality, which is where I think role playing is going to become a mainstream phenomenon. Um, you know, Pokemon Go was just the beginning. Um, but we're going to see an enormous 
um, Surge. And basically everything I'm designing now is designed to become an augmented reality game. Yes, um, but how does, that, how, do, how does that specific to, to, to visual design now? To what? The, the future of visual design in, uh, oh, visual in, in design. role playing. Design. Well, yeah. well in, ter in terms of visual design, um, you know, a phone screen is way smaller than a book, right? Um, it, it doesn't fit. You know, you have to find graphics that will look good on a small screen. And, and, and so if people are interfacing with your game, if their character sheet and the data they're getting and the information they're getting privately from the game master and the maps they're looking at, if everything's oriented towards the phone, then you have a very different visual criteria than you do if they're looking at a book, right? It's a, it's a very different thing. Yeah. And so you have to design with that in mind. And, and, the, and the, even to make it even worse, you have to design for now with a character sheet and books, but it has to be a little transition to that if you want longevity for your game. If you want your game to exist more than 10 years from now, uh, I believe there's gonna be a massive transition away from books and towards apps, either on the iPad or the phone or the computer. And that's a very different world, but, yeah. but, but surely that will happen where, where you know, COVID has shown that people will still game but they're going to game online, right? Mm -hmm. So, and it's a lot easier to look up stuff online, you're right, than it is to look up things in a book. So mm -hmm. people will probably be buying apps and the apps will give them all the information they need, not so much books. Interesting. Not now, <laughs> not five years from now, but definitely 10 years from now. That is the future. I'll still make books. I love books. Mm -hmm. I'll always love books. Yeah. But, will, but will the books make my money for me? Maybe not. Uh, Christopher, um, future of uh, visual design in RPGs. Well, I think that Mark is right to a certain extent. I think definitely augmented reality is going to have a huge place um, with like you point your phone at your book if you still have a book and you see some animation or something like that, which is, which is you know, going to be really, really cool. I, I can't wait for that to, to happen. I mean, I have three boys and a lot of the books that they get, you have, you download an app with it and then you point your phone or a tablet at the page and then all of a sudden something springs to life, you know? And I think that's going to be an amazing medium for, for RPGs as well. That's one aspect. The other aspect is I think with the tools available to people today, I think you're going to see even more of an explosion than you have in the last five years in terms of directions. Because right now, everybody can produce and publish quite elaborate pieces of work because you have all these tools available in terms of Photoshop and Illustrator and InDesign and so on and so forth. So, so you're going to see you're going to see a huge explosion in terms of creativity and probably taking us places we haven't even thought of yet. That's the second thing. I think thirdly role players are hoarders. There's no doubt about that. People <laughs> want to buy books. So that, that might not be where we make our money. Yeah. Although I think it is to be quite, I know it is what I, do. Um, but I mean, look at all your, your, your bookshelves behind you, pretty much everybody, right? Stuffed with books. And, and that's what we like, you know, because there's a difference between looking at something on a screen. It might be called for the game session, but you want this one, right? Mm -hmm. You want the tome, you want to flick through it, you want to feel the pages, you want to look at the artwork on a, you know, on a proper format in good color and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's going to go away. I mean, but maybe we're the dinosaurs. I don't know. Um, but I the like, youngest person here? Yeah, well, I don't think it's me, but I can still count myself a dinosaur in terms of that. Um, but I don't, I don't think that's going to go away ever. And I see it with, with, you know, with all the young players as well. They want the books because the books are cool, right? Um, and there's something... There's something geeky to it in a good kind of way to, you know, to sit with that and flick through the pages and so on and so forth. So many different directions, I think. Uh, Shame. I, I mean, I think, I think the digital transformation, you know, is, is going to take longer to impact our industry, but to a certain extent, it's already started. 
right? I, I you know, everyone, everyone I know that's playing D&D is using D&D Beyond, right? And, and they're looking to integrate that with virtual tabletops, especially during COVID. Uh, so the expectation uh, as, as a consumer of games is that if I'm going to engage with this gaming property, that I'm going to have access to digital tools that are going to facilitate or enhance my experience. And while I may appreciate having a book uh, so that I can sit and read it, at the same time, I'm also going to expect to have a digital copy of the book so that I can read it on my phone or my iPad or whatever when I travel. And then, uh, you know, I, I need to be able to engage with it with, with my friends, wherever they might be. And, um, you know, we really, you know, the past two years have taught us that virtual tabletop play has to mature uh, and has matured rapidly during the pandemic, uh, more so than, than it has it over the past, uh, but it still has a ways to go. And I think that integration of the rules learning experience and the digital expression at the table whether it's a virtual table or physical table, right? That still has to mature, but that is definitely the expectation, especially of the younger generation when they're trying to engage with these products. You know, I, 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 can't, I can't sell someone a copy of Neurosia at like 530 pages, right? It's, it's, not, it's not a point of engagement. They're, they, they, can't, they can't get with it. Now walk up to the table, we'll sit down and play. They'll have a great time, that's great. But in terms of, I don't, I don't want to learn this. And I think in general, the, the transition away from hobby games where, where we, where essentially players have homework, I think that transition is, is going to, to continue. People love to game. They're happy to sit down and game for five or six hours, but when they go away, they're not going to think about it, right? They're not going to work on their character. They're not going to, they're not going to do all that everything they need to do is at the table in that session. They can be 100% focused, but when they go away from it, they're not going to be. And games of yore had a homework <laughs> expectation, right? Right on. Diogo? Yeah, uh, I think especially for more the mainstream games like d and and other big names, the going digital, full digital, and having all these tools, it's, it's certainly in the future, certainly in the present already. Uh, but I think for the more indie games, there's a lot of, of stuff that even like handmade games, like they print themselves, they 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 do the the, the binding and and the gaming book as an artifact, it's like an object of art. It's really something big that I don't see going away like anytime soon. And and there's people making like videos, RPGs with, with uh, videos that you can play, like the, the the soundtrack. You buy games that have cassettes. That with with the soundtrack and even small dungeons in a cassette play, there's really this this gaming artifact that, especially for the indie scene, it's really iconic. Although there people are still like, experimenting with like these small websites that you can make small games like the the card, and and I think it's in the future. But by but treating the book as an artifact of art, like an object of art, is still going to be relevant even when we go full digital for many things because as 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 people said here like especially if there's like a lot of graphics and stuff like imagine like Morkborg you see Morkborg digital it's completely different from when you're experiencing the, the, the book like in physical format like the hot stamping all these these details that make it like a huge difference and I lose a lot of PDFs like to read or something, but, but to use at the table, to have the book there, to flip, to find the page and to combine, especially like uh, combining stuff. There, people are doing really great stuff with, with pages. Like you, you can uh, have the page cut in half and, and, and you mix and match parts of the book with different pages. And it's something that uh, people are exploring a lot. And, and I think that's really a possibility for like more small niche focused games, you know? Yeah. Uh, and last, but certainly not least, uh, Steven. I'm going to say, I don't know. And what <laughs> happens next will surprise the hell out of us because it always does. Yes. Um, uh, 
years ago, 10 years ago, I was working on apps for Pathfinder. We did an initiative tracker uh, that finally saw the light of day by another company later on. Um, the strange thing about, uh, you know, D&D Beyond being an exception uh, somewhat to this is um, people actually don't really like to interact with apps. And we know this uh, because Facebook and Twitter make it so addictive that it forces you to actually interact with that app. They'd much rather interact with people and especially in role-playing games. Um, one of the, the great aspects of a role-playing game, like, you know, if we want to talk about wonderful graphics and incredible realism and everything else, there are computer games galore to scratch that itch. But people who actually do love to role-play and will be long-term role-players, not, uh, you know, not the, the, the number of people who have bellied up to a D&D or a role-playing table uh, and then decided later on that that was not going to be part of their lives vastly outnumbers the number of people who play role-playing games even right now. Um, mm -hmm. It's if you don't have if you don't have that group if there's not a drive for you to go play it but there is a core of, of RPGers out there and there will always be a core of role playing gamers out there now that the genie is outside of the box and they are constantly going to innovate and um, and they'll surprise us so what's what's next for RPGs waiting to find out yeah can't wait yep excellent well this has been a, a fantastic conversation uh, with all of you and and from the bottom of my heart and and the rest of the staff at CamCon, thank you so much to everyone for uh, for, for for deigning to, to take the time uh, to participate in this. Um, I'd like to give you all uh, a moment or two if you want to um, uh, promote, plug anything you're working on right now. Uh, uh, Shane, you got Nova Nova Six. What's yeah, that? I mean, head head to legendsmith.com or nova6.com to to see what we're up to. You know, we're building towards the Kickstarter. And, you know, really excited. Uh, I'm, I'm putting the finishing touches on the VTT right now uh, so that, you know, people can play, especially with our weird dice mechanic because, you know, because there, there isn't a uh, dice roller out there that does it. So I like math and I, you know, I wrote it. So we'll, we'll have that available. You know, if you want to see how I think, you know, a mechanically strong player only role game with a lot of player agency would work. Uh, then go read Nova Six. It's a small game, cool. kept it simple, yeah. right? And that'll be right on point. So thank you cool. very much for for the panel. I love talking with these guys, and and uh, you know look forward to to meeting them in the future. Super. Yes, we'll pop a link for for that and anything else you guys mentioned in the uh, in the comments. Uh, uh, Joe, go. Oh, uh, well, you can follow my work. What I'm doing. I'm about to release. Uh, a couple of games probably this year and early next year. One is a supplement for my urban fantasy horror game, Dark Suits and Darkest Secrets, which is War of the Magi, which is a scenario setting for like wizard sorcerers and upcoming war that's going to happen in, in the world. And uh, a narrative game of space rangers that are dinosaurs, like Cosmosaurs, Inspired by 80s cartoon and, and forged, forged in the dark mechanics. And it's really one of the best looking games I've ever made. And it's really would fit very well here if I could show it. The, it's it, illustration by a comic artist and re, uh, graphic design for, for an amazing artist here in Brazil got, called Guilherme Gondito. And the, and the illustrator is Lucas Kowalski from, from Poland. And it's going to be like a 80 pages or so book, but it's full color, very beautiful, very iconic. And you can follow me at Twitter at Jogo underline old school or old school slash publishing.com. And I always publishing what I'm developing and doing and drawing. I, I like to share the process a lot. And that's another, another advice I would give to people uh, get into the hobby, get into creating stuff share the process so people can see what you're doing, what your game is about and, 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 and engage with you and you can learn so much from that. Yeah. Uh, Steven? 
Uh, well, I'm uh, a dedicated freelancer right now, so I work uh, with a number of companies, uh, do freelance work. But uh, my my passion project uh, uh, is uh, a game called Delve, which is a fantasy role playing D twenty based game, uh, but has a lot of surprises. Uh, throw out a lot of sacred cows. There's no experience points. There's there is a <laughs> sort of alignment that is more kind of a cosmic structure, but it's something that you opt into. Uh, there's no initiative rules. Uh, there's no fire and forget spells. Sort of, uh, you can sacrifice spells for greater effects and everything else. So I, I, I play with the forms. It's sort of the things that I really like about this that that kind of system and throw away everything I don't in in fun and exciting ways. It uses my three act uh, uh, economy, which I originally designed for Pathfinder First Edition as an option, and now is uh, the core to Pathfinder second edition. Um, oh, you did the three action system? Yeah. That's awesome, by the way. Thank you. I really, uh, really love that. that that's it, a very, very- Well, you're gonna like Delves even better because it's, <laughs> uh, it's even better. So. Um, but, uh, and you, I, I, I write a blog at delve-rpg.com. Uh, I just wrote a thing about how people don't play higher level adventures. Uh, and what that they means. No, do they? No, they do not. Um, yeah, if you look at the statistics on uh, now that we can have statistics because of online play, like people tend to not play at all. Yeah, over my seventh it, level, it's yeah. like amazing. Uh, and it, it drops off to uh, like almost zero. Yeah, um, I mean the fourteenth level, almost zero. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, I use the D and D Beyond statistics that they shared in two thousand nineteen to to show that. So interesting. Um, Christopher. Sorry, just had to unmute there. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, well, you can find uh, Black Void at blackvoidgames.com or the Modifius Net uh, website. And we just finished the, uh, the recent source slash campaign book called Under Nebulous Skies. And it's going to be in retail probably in December depending on whether the printer gets the, their act together or not. We're keeping our fingers crossed. Um, and in the near future, we're going to release a, an adventure compendium, which is going to be shorter adventures because I tend to release campaigns because I like campaigns. Um, but we're trying to do something more for uh, con play. Uh, so shorter, more compact games that you can actually use as introduction scenarios and so on and so forth nice. as well. And then in early 2022, we're going to release a miniature range Ooh, for Black Void. Wow. Oh, that thing is That's killer. That very, and very cool. I'm, I'm just going to, because you see the yeah, similarity, yeah. hopefully, maybe, right? Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. No, I, I just start right away. <laughs> can I have so, one that size? <laughs> you can, actually, yeah. So what we're doing, we're doing two things. We're releasing them as STL files so you can print them on your 3D printers. And we're probably going to do physical fulfillment as well. So if you don't have a 3D printer, we can print them for you and send them to you. Yes. Um, so very exciting times for that, for sure. Oh, awesome. Excellent. And, and Mark? Uh, so um, I'm back. Uh, and... Uh, <laughs> What I'm doing for the next 10 years is Lost Lauren. And Lost Lauren isn't a game, it's a series. It's like the, it's basically the world of darkness, but done in a fantasy world. And this is the fantasy world I invented when I was 13 and alone in the, you know, cornfields of Minnesota. And um, basically it's, uh, we're, we're doing, you know, the monster point of view um, in a fantasy world. So. The first game was Bad Lantern, which is a kind of like our Hunters Hunted. Then there's Fang Knight, which is going to be our vampire, and then Werewolf. And, and then it gets on to, of course, where you can play dragons and what, whatever. Um, but it's a 10-game series over 10 years. And uh, uh, I don't know quite why I decided to do this, but I did. And I'm dedicated to it. And uh, I have a great team. And, um, um, you know, uh, even though it uses D&D &D 5e rules, which I know a lot of people who are fans of me hate. Um, I just want to say that uh, any game system is not intrinsically good or bad. It's what you do with it. 
and 5e is uh, in many ways and a lot of the other d20 games like the three action system have some amazing and beautiful rules that are really wonderful and so just because something is a d20 game doesn't make it bad so um what i did in, in making this game is i i took what the voice of greg stafford and me who was my mentor and uh, sandy who was my also my mentor and and kind of uh <laughs> The three of us collaborated on designing a, a version of 5e that was a storytelling game, which is why our character sheet has dots. dots. Um, so uh, all I ask you to do is, even if you hate if you hate D D, just look at our character sheet, and uh, if you love playing the monster, um, check out Lost Lorne because uh, um, you want to be able to say someday that you were there when. And um, uh, I'm not taking any money from this. Uh, I'm very lucky that I was on the board of directors of Wizard of the Coast early on, and so all the money goes to the creators, um, at least for now, until my kids go to college. Uh, in that case, I'm screwed. <laughs> totally screwed, because the money is running out. But um, anyway, at that point, hopefully I'll, I'll be making something enough to pay the creators and me. But um, please uh, support us, and um, um, please keep track. You can find us uh, mainly on Facebook, Go to Lost Learn and join our, our secret group and you can know everything that's going on. Excellent. Well, again, thank you very much to everyone. Um, and thank you to everyone who came in, listened and, and gave us questions. Um, uh, this was a fantastic experience uh, for me personally as well. Talked to all of you, uh, learned a lot and I, I hope to, to, to interface with, with all of you again at some point in the future. Um, and uh, again, thank you so much. Had a great time. Uh, too, Thank James. you very much, Camcom. Right on. We'll Thank see you, you all later. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Cheers. Cheers. There we go. Okay, are we out, Jeff? We're out. Okay. <laughs> We're out. <laughs> that was a great oh. panel, guys. I really liked it. it oh, that was of interesting insights. Oh yes, no. I was, yeah. I was I was getting worried during the first half hour that oh it's like this is going to go real short, and then all of a sudden things started to go real long. Yeah. So I hope I didn't. <laughs> yeah. I didn't. I mean, there was choice. one other question uh, in the chat, and I'm like, but we're starting to wrap up. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's sort of the reason I didn't. I didn't go after the one that uh, uh, still. Uh,